What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid. Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Aoi approached Renjiro with a stern expression, his gaze piercing as he sought an explanation for Renjiro's seemingly reckless actions on the battlefield. What in the hell were you thinking? Aoi's voice was edged with a mixture of frustration and concern, his eyes narrowing as he awaited an answer. It took some time for Renjiro to realize that Aoi was addressing him, as he thought he might be addressing some of his subordinates. I'm talking to you, young man. Aoi repeated. What do you mean? Renjiro inquired. Why did you use all those explosive tags on the battleground? Renjiro, still catching his breath from the intense battle, furrowed his brows in confusion. They had more chunins than us, so I wanted to eliminate them as fast as possible, Aoi's expression tightened further, his disbelief evident. As fast as possible? Do you realize those explosive tags of yours took out some of my ninjas? Renjiro's eyes widened as he processed the gravity of Aoi's words. Skeptical of it, he turned to Aiko and Hiro and from the expression on their faces, he could tell Aoi was telling the truth. The revelation hit Renjiro like a shuriken to the chest. At that moment, the reality of his action sank in, and an overwhelming sense of responsibility pressed down on him. A dull ache of regret gnawed at Renjiro's conscience. The progress he had made, the skills he had honed, now seemed trivial in the face of the lives lost due to his lack of foresight. Renjiro opened his mouth to respond, but before he could utter a word, Riku interjected, Aoi, it was in the heat of battle, sometimes split-second decisions are all you have. Renjiro acted on instinct to protect himself and eliminate an imminent threat. Besides, berating him about it now wouldn't change a single thing. He's taking my side? I did mess up. I was in my head and caused the death of my allies. If he was honest, Renjiro agreed with Aoi. He got carried away and messed up. Besides, he is a genin and chunin were closing in on him. What did you want him to do? Riku finished. Despite being engaged in battle, Riku was keeping an eye on what was happening on the battlefield. He was a bit shocked by Renjiro's rampage, as well as proud when he saw him going against countless chunins. He did not need to be informed of the events that occurred like Aoi. Aoi's expression remained skeptical as he turned his attention to Riku. Optimal or not, it cost us three chunins and six genins from the land of mountains. We could have handled the situation differently. Riku, undeterred, countered, true, the casualties were unfortunate, but Renjiro's actions prevented potential harm to himself and others. In battle, sacrifices happen. Renjiro made a judgment call, and we need to adapt and learn from it. Aoi sighed, recognizing the complexity of the situation. Do these guys think that raising shinobi to that rank in our nation is easy? We are not a major power and the undertaking is resource intensive. Anyway, the daimyo should handle this with Konoha. Choosing not to pursue the matter, they all diverted their attention to their forces. There were some wounded during the battle and also some who had perished. After giving them some first aid and storing their bodies in scrolls for a respectful send-off, they turned to address the biggest elephant in the room. How were they going to split the loot from the bandits? Without further ado, they ventured into the remnants of the bandit hideout. The once menacing structure now stood in ruins, a testament to the fierce confrontation that had taken place moments ago. Riku took the lead, he was scanning the surroundings for any signs of hidden threats. Along the way, they found mangled bodies. These belonged to shinobi serving under the brothers, who were caught unaware and crushed by the collapse of their hideout. With caution, they descended into the dimly lit cavern. They were surprised that the cavern was still standing despite the tremors caused by Riku earlier. As they progressed, the faint glimmer of chakra crystals caught their attention. Riku examined the crystals, recognizing their value. 
Chakra crystals, coveted for their use in various applications such as enhancing chakra affinity, were a prized possession among shinobi. Further exploration revealed a cache of stolen ninja weapons, neatly arranged in racks. Swords, kunai, and shuriken hinted at the bandits' audacious raids on unsuspecting shinobi. Amidst the spoils, they discovered crates filled with provisions, non-perishable food, clothing, and personal belongings of civilians. It became evident that the bandits preyed upon the local populace, pillaging their homes and confiscating whatever they could find. They sure were busy, Riku remarked seeing the loot the bandits had managed to acquire. After ascertaining that that was all there was, they discussed the distribution of the valuables. Without the other team, they would not have been able to exterminate the bandit threat. Since they had the bodies of the Jounin and Renjiro's mishap they get a small quantity of the chakra crystals. This was Riku's way of placating Aoi because of the earlier incident. Aoi accepted but he is still mad about losing members of his force since they were a close-knit group. They quickly returned to Osaka where they all rested since it was still in the wee hours of the morning. After a period of rest and recuperation, Team 15 set their sights on returning to Konoha. The journey back to Konoha was marked by an unusual stillness within Renjiro. While the physical landscape changed as they traveled, his internal landscape was dominated by the echoes of the recent mission. Renjiro, deep in contemplation, found himself comparing the weight of his choices. Taking a life, even in self-defense, felt less burdensome than the unintended consequences of ending some over a hasty decision. His teammates, sensing the shift in Renjiro's demeanor, exchanged concerned glances but chose to give him the space he needed. Riku realized that this was a pivotal moment for Renjiro's growth. What matters is how he will react to this. He told himself as they neared Konoha, Riku decided that addressing the issue would come in due time, allowing Renjiro the time to grapple with his own demons. It was already in the evening when Team 15 made their way to the mission center. Entering the mission center, they were greeted by the low hum of activity. Mahito looked up from his desk, his eyes scanning the returning shinobi. He had grown accustomed to the punctuality and efficiency of Team 15, yet this time, something seemed different. The addition of chakra crystals to their inventory caught his attention. Riku stepped forward, we've completed the mission, Mahito. Found the rogue ninjas and exterminated them. We also got some loot from them. Chakra crystals, eh? That's an unexpected bonus, he remarked, a hint of surprise coloring his usually composed expression when Riku passed him a scroll containing the crystals. The village had a high demand for chakra crystals, and the unexpected acquisition was a welcome addition. Well done, Team 15. You've not only fulfilled the mission but brought back something valuable for the village. The Hokage will be pleased. The acknowledgement brought a sense of accomplishment to the team, a reassurance that their efforts were recognized. Mahito, with a nod of approval, concluded the mission report and issued their remuneration. Take a well-deserved rest, and if there's anything else, you know where to find me, Riku said as he flickered away. After finishing up with the mission center, they all headed back to their homes. As Renjiro approached his house, he noticed the figure of Uchiha Sora near his doorstep. It seemed like she was just about to leave, and their unexpected encounter caught both of them off guard. Sara turned slightly, her eyes meeting Renjiro's as he approached. Renjiro, too, was taken aback by her presence, not expecting to find anyone waiting for him. Renjiro reflected on the past, remembering the time when Sara and her brother Kaido were his classmates back at the academy. The trio had shared the journey of aspiring shinobi, attending classes, and sometimes training together. However, circumstances led Renjiro to graduate early, and as a result, they gradually fell out of touch. Life in the shinobi world often propelled individuals on divergent paths, with each pursuing their own goals and responsibilities. Renjiro, Sara greeted, I thought that you were not at home. I have been checking daily for the last three days. Renjiro replied, I just arrived from a mission. He opened up his house and gestured for Sora to get in. So, what brings you here? Renjiro inquired. Sara took a moment before answering, well, some of us were thinking of having a small get-together. You know, to celebrate our graduation from the academy. Since you, Aiko and Hiro are already genins maybe you could come and give us pointers? Ooh, they've already graduated? I've been too busy to keep track of time. 
It has already been half a year since I became a ninja. Rinjiro nodded, that sounds like a great idea. I'd love to join. Sora's eyes lit up with enthusiasm. Fantastic. We're planning to have a meal tomorrow evening. Oh, and I almost forgot, we'd really like Hiro and Aiko to be there too. A meal? Count me in. Rinjiro's expression turned thoughtful. Hiro and Aiko, huh? I'll make sure to pass on the invitation. I'm sure they would appreciate it. As Sora prepared to take her leave, she couldn't help but express her genuine joy at the prospect of their gathering. Rinjiro, it's good to see you again. I'll see you tomorrow? Rinjiro smiled, appreciating the sentiment. Indeed, Sara. I will also see you tomorrow. With that, Sara bid Rinjiro farewell. Perfect, I need something to distract me from my last mission. Plus, it would be great to see how much those guys have grown. Closing his eyes, Renjiro took a moment to acknowledge the emotions swirling within him. Pride for their successful mission and growth in power, regret for the collateral damage, and a resolute commitment to learn from the experience. Let me make a few seals before calling it a night. Renjiro made a few seals before sleeping. After all, he was still saving up for his weapon. The following morning, the team engaged in a light training session to maintain their combat readiness. As the training session concluded, Riku, satisfied with their progress, gathered the team for a brief debriefing. You are all showing great improvement, he remarked, keep it up and remember, each mission is a chance to refine your skills and learn from the challenges you face. With a nod of acknowledgement, the team dispersed. Later that day, the team gathered at a designated spot for the meetup Sora had talked about. Rinjiro had earlier informed Aiko and Hiro about it before they began their training and they both accepted. They would usually use their afternoons for personal training, but considering the fact that they just completed a mission the previous day, they choose to use this meetup to unwind. It had been a busy couple of months, with non-stop training and missions in between. The barbecue joint they were to meet was nestled in a cozy corner of the village and welcomed Renjiro, Hiro, and Aiko with a tantalizing aroma that wafted through the air. Upon stepping inside, the trio found themselves in a vibrant and bustling space. The interior was adorned with wooden accents, giving the place a warm and inviting atmosphere. Tables equipped with built-in grills stood ready for patrons to embark on their culinary adventure. The familiar faces of their former classmates greeted the Genins. Laughter and camaraderie filled the air as they spotted Kenta and Hayori Hyuga, Sara and Kaido Uchiha, Makoto Inazuka, and Eri Yamanaka gathered around a table. Renjiro. Hiro. Aiko. Hayori called out, waving them over. They immediately joined them and enjoyed the ambience. Sara remarked, I am glad you guys showed up. Renjiro chuckled, well, why would we pass a chance to meet friends? Plus, I heard there's good food involved. Makoto chimed in, speaking of food, have you guys decided what you want to grill? Hiro nodded, I'm thinking bulgogi for starters. What about you, Aiko? Aiko considered the options, I'll go for some pork belly. As they settled into their seats, the conversations flowed effortlessly. Kenta shared stories from the academy, while Eri inquired about their experiences as a new team. So, have you guys had any interesting missions lately? Sara asked, her eyes gleaming with curiosity. Hiro leaned back, well, we just got back from the land of mountains. Where we dealt with some rogue shinobis. Kaido raised an eyebrow, rogue shinobis? That sounds intense. How did it go? Aiko chimed in, it had its moments, but we managed. Rika-sensei was there to guide us. Makoto, ever eager for action, grinned, I wish we had some rogue ninja to deal with. Hayori added, at least it's peaceful. I heard Hei couldn't make it. Said it would be a drag in his words. Eri giggled, classic Hei, Always finding an excuse. As the grilling commenced, the group shared stories of their academy days, reminisced about shared experiences, and discussed their aspirations as newly graduated shinobi. Renjiro raised an eyebrow in surprise when Kaido casually mentioned that he had graduated as the top student. Kaido as the top student? Did he awaken his Sharingan? Well, that's a surprise. I always thought Kenta would automatically be the top student once I graduated. But then again, it wouldn't be surprising if Kaido got a bit serious during their final year. Plus he's more social and welcoming to me than he was in the past. Maybe he did change. Top of the class, huh? 
Renjiro grinned, genuinely impressed. Well done, Kaido. Kaido shrugged modestly, it wasn't much since you performed even better at the promotion exam. The group chuckled, and Kenta added, don't let him fool you. Kaido worked hard for it. With the revelation about Kaido's achievement, the conversation naturally shifted to their Genin promotions exams. Renjiro listened as they shared their experiences, and it became evident that their journey closely mirrored his own, without the unexpected Genjutsu incident. As the discussion unfolded, Sara, Kaido, and the others turned their attention to the Genins, seeking advice on navigating the challenges of becoming Genins. Well, first things first, Renjiro began, be ready for a variety of missions. Some will be routine, others might surprise you. Always stay adaptable. Hero chimed in, and teamwork is key. Your teammates will become like family, and you'll rely on each other more than you think. Aiko nodded, exactly. Communication is crucial, both in and out of battle. Always keep your team informed, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Renjiro added, also, embrace continuous learning. Train regularly, explore new jutsus, and seek guidance from your superiors. The village has a wealth of knowledge to offer. Sara, ever inquisitive, asked, what about facing tougher opponents? Any advice on that? Renjiro smirked, recalling his own encounters, face challenges head on, but know your limits. It's okay to retreat and regroup if needed. And learn from every defeat. That's how you grow stronger. The conversation soon touched on their genin lives so far and after hearing their encounters, the rest could only think that it was quite underwhelming. Renjiro chimed in, you know, genin life isn't always about constant action. Sometimes, the lulls in between missions are a chance to train and learn new techniques. Like what I've been doing. Makoto raised an eyebrow, but you've been on only two missions in the last six months. It feels like you're not doing much at all. Renjiro nodded, true, missions are the lifeblood of a shinobi, but they're not the only aspect. Training and preparation are equally vital. It's about being ready for anything, even if it means facing periods of apparent inactivity. Plus I feel like Rikusensei is prioritizing our learning so that we become more combat effective on the field. Aiko added, and let's not forget that missions can be dangerous. It's not just about the thrill, it's about being cautious and making sure we're well prepared. Anything can go wrong, and it's better to be safe than sorry. Kaido sighed, I thought being a genin would be more, eventful, you know? Sara nudged him, well, Kaido, not every day is going to be a dangerous mission. Renjiro agreed, exactly. Cherish the times of peace, but stay vigilant. As the night drew to a close, Renjiro and his genin teammates bid farewell to their friends. The group disbanded, each member heading home with the promise of another day. Renjiro felt a sense of contentment in the connections he had forged, knowing that in the unpredictable world of Shinobi, having trustworthy allies was invaluable. Hiro broke the silence. Well, that was a pleasant surprise. Sara nodded, yeah, it was nice. We should do that more often. They reached their respective homes, each genin bidding the others good night. Renjiro, entering his house, closed the door behind him. It had been a long day and his social batteries had already been depleted. A sense of excitement and determination fueled Renjiro's every movement as he prepared for the day ahead. It was finally the day when he was going to get his weapon. The familiar routine of getting ready felt different this time, with an undercurrent of eagerness beneath each action. Renjiro meticulously donned his shinobi attire, adjusting the straps and securing the necessary tools on his person. Exiting his house, Renjiro navigated the familiar streets of the clan estate with purpose. It was already stirring with activity with vendors setting up their stalls, fellow shinobi embarking on their daily duties. As he approached the clan's weapon shop, Renjiro's heart quickened its pace. Pushing open the door, the weapon shop greeted him with an array of blades, kunai, and other tools of the shinobi trade. The weapon master, Achiha Kagetsuchi, looked up from his workbench, acknowledging Renjiro's arrival with a nod. He had been a shinobi, but after the first shinobi war, he retired after his leg was amputated and decided to try his luck in blacksmithing. Renjiro, you are here for your bois, aren't you? I was wondering when you would come for it. It has been rotting in my storage for over a week, the weapon master inquired. Renjiro nodded, unable to contain the grin spreading across his face. I was on a mission and just arrived the other day. 
Rinjiro's journey to acquire the Bois, the bladed staff had been on his mind for a while. In the days leading up to this momentous occasion, he had dedicated himself to creating and selling seals to earn the necessary funds. Kagetsuchi retrieved the Bois, a masterpiece of design and functionality. Its ends were bladed, while its unique feature allowed it to be separated into two bladed batons. Here it is, the weapons master said, handing the staff to Renjiro. Made from a special alloy that incorporates chakra metal. It's sturdy, sharp, and can be separated into two for dual wielding. It's perfect, Renjiro remarked. Exactly what I was hoping for. The weapons master nodded in satisfaction. Take good care of it, Renjiro. A weapon is an extension of the shinobi, and this one, in particular, demands respect. Rinjiro bowed in gratitude, cradling the staff in his hands. Thank you. I'll make sure it sees good use. The boy felt balanced and powerful in his grip, a tool that Rinjiro hoped would accompany him on countless missions and battles. Rinjiro, now in possession of the bois, wasted no time in exploring its myriad capabilities within the confines of his backyard. Eager to understand the full potential of his newly acquired weapon, he initiated a series of tests that would showcase its versatility in combat scenarios. With a focused mind, Rinjiro discovered a mechanism integrated into the bois that allowed the blades at both ends to retract, transforming the staff into a seemingly ordinary weapon. This feature added an element of surprise to his combat strategy, enabling him to conceal the bladed nature of the staff until the opportune moment. In a swift motion, Renjiro then decided to unlock another facet of the Boas design. Separating the staff into two distinct batons, he explored the dual-wielding capabilities that this configuration offered. As the blades gleamed in the sunlight, Renjiro's movements became a seamless dance of precision and agility. The boar responded to his control, attesting to the synergy between the weapon and its wielder. Renjiro paced in his backyard as thoughts of how he could make the weapon more effective echoed in his mind. Yeah, concealing the blades by retracting them is all good, but experienced shinobi would have some sort of super survival instinct after honing their senses to the extreme. I can use Jinjutsu to hide them so that even if they sense and break the Jinjutsu, I can easily retract the blades. As he twirled the staff, he envisioned employing Jinjutsu to the mix, musing, imagine sensing a Jinjutsu on my staff, breaking it and realizing that there was nothing there that it was hiding. Only to be cut later by my blades. The confusion that sets in when they try to figure this out would give me a clear opening to end the battle. The idea intrigued him. I could also go an extra mile by coating the blades with poison like how Suna does to their puppets, but Konoha does not have any specialized poison users unless I find an aburame to collaborate with. But dealing with bugs just freaks me out. That said, I need to learn Jinjutsu. The only step I've made in that field is learning to break them, and two, I can't say that I am immune to all of them. This is something that I should have gotten to earlier and it's criminally insane that I did not since I already have a Sharingan. I should also get into medical ninjutsu. It would help me gain enough knowledge on making my poisons. I think combining it with chemistry knowledge from my previous world would really help in creating potent poisons. But maybe I could sort the poison thing with Fuenjutsu, right? Or maybe even add Juenjutsu on top of that. Renjiro massaged his temples, now, this is just crazy. I just got this weapon and I'm thinking of more fields to get in. I should just prioritize them on the basis of what my current skill sets can accommodate. I should try medical ninjutsu, that's for sure, but not right now. The advanced chakra control prerequisite is a bit stringent as there is a 50-50 chance that I would flourish in it. If I'm honest, I'd rate my chakra control a bit over average which is actually an accomplishment considering where I came from and my chakra reserves. Jinjutsu is a must, and I should get into it as soon as possible based just on its versatility and personal preference. I already have a 3 Tomo Sharingan, so I am pretty confident in getting a hang of it. For Fuenjutsu, I should first increase my mastery on it before even considering Juenjutsu as that requires Orikimaru level of experimentation. Maybe I could look for him in the future so that he could help me with it. But it can be a double-edged sword as he could use the curse seal on me. Has he already perfected it by now? Either way, it is best not to take chances with that guy. So in summary, I should focus on Jinjutsu, Taijutsu which also includes mastering the Bois and Fuenjutsu while also expanding my Jutsu's collection.
Too much to do. But how should I learn Jinjutsu? I could always ask Fugaku. But approaching a Jounin like him would be weird since we don't really have that much in common. Plus, he is the clan head's son so he's already on a pedestal, which is something that I would not like to associate myself with, at least not right now. Arg! Renjiro yelled in frustration. Why am I overthinking? I should just start small by reading up on it and self-practicing. Plus I could also observe and analyze Jinjutsu techniques during combat with my Sharingan. It might unveil the necessary information and experience that I want. Eyes narrowing, Renjiro's face lit up as a spark of realization ignited within him. A surge of excitement coursed through his veins, and he couldn't help but grin at the breakthrough he felt was within reach. What if I try casting basic Jinjutsu on myself? Renjiro thought out loud. I don't think this is a good idea Renjiro, Aiko said with skepticism evident on her face. I already told you. It's all for research purposes. Renjiro replied egging her on. Are you sure that you will be fine? Aiko sighed, still hesitant. Even after weighing the pros and cons of what they were about to do, she did not see how this would be a good idea. Renjiro leaned in, his gaze earnest. Aiko, I wouldn't be asking if I didn't trust you. As long as we take it slow, then I'm sure I have nothing to worry about. Aiko sighed, realizing that Renjiro was not easily swayed once he set his mind on something. Fine, but remember, it can be disorienting. Don't push yourself too hard. Renjiro grinned, grateful for Aiko's reluctant agreement. Thank you, Aiko. Don't worry. If it gets hard, I will do my best to break out of it. No, he wouldn't. He was straight up lying. He wanted to take the full brunt of it. Some may call it madness, and a few may even call it courageous but we all know that the difference between a mad person and a courageous person is that the courageous person succeeded in what they were doing after everything aligned together. As Aiko performed the hand signs with practice precision, she focused her chakra on casting the Jinjutsu. Yes. Renjiro, with his infinite knowledge and wisdom, came up with a not-so-bright idea of learning Jinjutsu by experiencing it. A few minutes ago, Renjiro approached Aiko with his proposition. The air was thick with anticipation as he explained his plan to use Aiko's Jinjutsu skills to cast Jinjutsu on him. It was an audacious attempt to bridge the gap between the Sharingan and Jinjutsu, and Aiko couldn't help but be skeptical. Despite Renjiro's persuasive arguments, Aiko hesitated. The risks associated with delving into Jinjutsu were not to be taken lightly, and she voiced her concerns. Renjiro, however, remained resolute, convinced that this collaboration could lead to groundbreaking results. You have to give him his props as his first idea of casting Jinjutsu on himself clearly did not work. He did not even know how to cast one, let alone how to do so to himself. Sozo, Atsuwa no Hanabira, Aiko uttered as she activated the Jinjutsu. The phrase used translated to demonic illusion, shifting petals technique. Renjiro found himself ensnared within the intricate threads of the Jinjutsu, a dance of illusion that unfolded before his very eyes. The world around him transformed, petals of deception swirling like a delicate breeze. He stood in awe, momentarily captivated by the beauty of the illusory blossoms that replaced the mundane reality. The Jutsu Aiko had used, Sozo, Atsuwa no Hanabira, was a C-rank Jinjutsu designed to manipulate the perception of a nearby object, creating an illusion that alters its appearance. The technique was inspired by the principles of Megan, Kokoni Arezu no Jutsu which served as an introductory yet effective tool in the arsenal of illusionists. To initiate the Jinjutsu, the user performs a sequence of swift and precise hand seals, channeling chakra into the immediate vicinity of the chosen target. The Jutsu's range extends from short to mid-range, making it versatile for tactical use on various objects within the user's visual field. Upon activation, the targeted object undergoes a captivating transformation akin to delicate flower petals fluttering in the wind. The illusion introduces subtle changes to color, texture, and form, creating the impression of a different object altogether. The altered appearance is carefully crafted to blend seamlessly with the surroundings, ensuring a convincing and harmonious illusion. Spectators within the Jutsu's range perceive the affected object according to the illusion's design. For instance, a simple rock could appear as a vibrant blossom or a harmless tree stump. 
The altered object retains its physical properties, making tactile detection challenging for those ensnared by the illusion. While Sozo, Utsurwa no Hanabira is effective in deceiving the visual senses, it does not confer any additional properties to the object. If the Jinjutsu is scrutinized closely or touched with intent, the true nature of the object becomes apparent. By momentarily altering the appearance of objects within their environment, users can create distractions, mislead adversaries, or conceal vital elements of their surroundings. Despite it being a C-rank Jinjutsu, it was fairly easy to learn. Its high rank was because of the potential the Jinjutsu had when used correctly. Sozo, Atsuwa no Hanabira. Rinjiro mumbled, recognizing the nature of the Jinjutsu. His Sharingan dissected the Jinjutsu with analytical precision. Petals continued their graceful dance, each movement concealing a layer of intricacy. Each petal seemed to carry a fragment of the fabricated reality, an artful manipulation of perception. It seems mundane, but it capitalizes on messing with someone's perception. This is actually more dangerous because if you can't rely on your senses in battle, then you are as good as dead. Renjiro's gaze detected the orchestrated dance of chakra within the fabricated environment. The petals now revealed themselves as conduits of Aiko's chakra, weaving an intricate tapestry of deception. The Uzumaki marveled at the elegance with which Aiko manipulated her chakra to create a mesmerizing spectacle. Chakra threads, she's utilizing them to shape the illusion. It's not just about what I see, it's about how my chakra reacts to the false stimuli. Rinjiro's thoughts echoed within the inner recesses of his mind. His Sharingan became a keen observer of the subtle interplay between Aiko's chakra and his own. As he delved deeper into the illusion, Renjiro consciously allowed the deceptive threads to entwine with his chakra system. He relinquished the instinctual desire to resist, opting instead for an immersive study of the Jinjutsu's impact on his senses. The Utsuwa no Hanabira became a living laboratory, and Renjiro, the inquisitive scientist. His Sharingan honed in on the fluctuations within his own chakra signature. Each petal sway resonated with a nuanced response from his chakra network, a symphony of interactions between reality and illusion. Fascinating, my chakra is adapting to the illusion, integrating with its deceptive nature. Aiko's manipulation extends beyond visual stimuli, it's echoing through the very essence of my being. But that's understandable since chakra is the essence of every being in this world, shinobi, or not. Renjiro marveled at the harmony forged between the Jinjutsu and his chakra. I've seen enough. As he dispelled the illusion, Renjiro found himself transitioning from the fabricated surroundings back to reality. The abrupt shift left a lingering sense of disorientation, yet Renjiro welcomed it with a determined smirk. Aiko directed her attention to Renjiro as he dispelled the Jinjutsu. Renjiro, are you okay? Aiko's voice carried a tone of genuine worry her eyes scanning him for any signs of distress. You have dispelled it, I hope it wasn't too much. Renjiro, meeting Aiko's gaze with an impish glint in his eyes, chuckled lightly. Well, I already got a feel of it rather I want to try something out. Aiko, her concern now mingled with curiosity, couldn't help but probe further. What do you mean? Right, what were the hand signs again? Aiko, caught off guard, watched with widened eyes as Renjiro made a few hand seals and muttered the incantation for the same Jinjutsu, Sozo, Utsuwa no Hanabira. Renjiro took a deep breath, channeling his chakra with a focused intensity. With a swift series of hand signs, he replicated the pattern Aiko had demonstrated for her Jinjutsu. The air shimmered with subtle chakra as Renjiro seamlessly wove the Jinjutsu, drawing from the mental blueprint etched in his memory when he was under the influence of the Jinjutsu. How is he doing it so effortlessly? I guess this is what talent looks like. Must be nice. I struggled for a whole month to perform it. Aiko couldn't hide her surprise. Her eyes widened as she witnessed Renjiro casting the intricate Jinjutsu on his very first attempt. The proficiency with which he executed the hand signs and manipulated the chakra indicated a level of mastery that surpassed her expectations for a beginner. The Jinjutsu unfolded gradually, manifesting the same serene landscape that Aiko had previously conjured. The dappling sunlight and the rustling leaves materialized around them, creating an ethereal environment. It was as though Renjiro had effortlessly cast the Jinjutsu with an innate understanding of its intricacies. It looks similar to Aiko's, but if I were to compare the two, 
I'd say mine is in 360p quality while hers would be in 4K. That's a huge difference. It still needs work, but this should be good enough for my first try. The success of his casting surprised even him, but he remained composed, determined to explore the depths of the genjutsu he had just created. Aiko, recovering from her initial shock, watched Renjiro with a mix of admiration and realization. You! You did it, but how? She stammered, unable to conceal her amazement. Aiko was not affected by the genjutsu because she had spent hours testing herself with various genjutsu and she now built up a resistance against it. Instead, she now became a spectator in Renjiro's display. I don't even know. I was not even sure it would work at all. Renjiro was also at a loss for words. Talent, much like a hidden spring, often flows effortlessly without the carrier fully understanding its source. People with innate abilities might excel in certain areas without grasping the intricacies of their talent. The flow is so natural that they don't consciously perceive the mechanisms that make them proficient. Renjiro's journey into Genjutsu bore a resemblance to this phenomenon. His proficiency with his Sharingan seemed almost instinctual, a talent ingrained in his very being. The hand signs, the manipulation of chakra, and the creation of the Genjutsu felt like second nature to him. As he effortlessly replicated the complex Genjutsu, Renjiro found himself in a realm where talent and mastery converged. Yet, much like the talented artist who might struggle to articulate their creative process, Renjiro didn't have a comprehensive understanding of why Jinjutsu came naturally to him. The metaphorical spring of talent within him flowed, and the waters of Jinjutsu carved intricate patterns. It was as if the Sharingan, an ancient gift passed down through generations, whispered forgotten secrets to Renjiro's subconscious. That's your first attempt, Renjiro. It usually takes much longer for someone to grasp the nuances of Jinjutsu. I guess I've been underestimating my Sharingan. It feels like I've been exposed to Jinjutsu for much longer than I thought. Since it only manipulates the perception of nearby objects, it really isn't harmful to the target. It only puts them into a trance-like state. This can still be used in fights and the targets would be in a trance and not even know how they died. But wait, can I change this scene? Renjiro wondered as an idea popped into his mind. In a matter of seconds, the serene scene was replaced by a dark and twisted one. The sky turned blood red, the ground became ashen and an ominous wind blew, a stark contrast to what was initially there. What is happening? Aiko inquired. Is he changing the jutsu, but how? This environment is too peaceful for distracting my enemies with. But the purpose of the jutsu is to lull their senses, if you do this and scare them wouldn't that make it counterproductive? Aiko, you are severely underestimating the power of fear. Besides distracting the target, you can also use this to put them in a trance-like condition, so this would just be the cherry on top. Whatever you say. Still, to alter a jinjutsu on your first try. It's as if your Sharingan has an inherent connection to jinjutsu. Ah, that's right. She came from a civilian background, so she hasn't been exposed to Uchiha's using Jinjutsu. I'm not quite sure how this pans out with the others, but I am sure there must be others who are more talented than me in the clan. Rinjiro quickly dispelled the Jinjutsu. And they found themselves back in the realm of reality. Aiko had initially hesitated to assist him in his pursuit of Jinjutsu, but witnessing his swift mastery was a revelation. Rinjiro, wearing a faint but confident smile, approached Aiko. Thanks, Aiko. Your help made a significant difference. I've got a lot to explore with Jinjutsu, and I can't wait to see where this path leads. Aiko couldn't help but feel a sense of pride, I'm glad I could help, Renjiro. You are my teammate, so if you improve, that also helps me. But please don't be reckless next time. Renjiro's expression turned thoughtful. I understand the risks, Aiko. Besides, every technique carries risks. It's about how you wield them. As they prepared to part ways, Aiko couldn't shake the feeling that Renjiro had embarked on a transformative journey. Good luck, Renjiro. I hope your exploration into Jinjutsu brings you everything you're looking for. With a parting nod, Renjiro headed towards the library. Renjiro entered the library, his strides purposeful, and his eyes narrowed with newfound determination. The encounter with Jinjutsu had stirred something within him, a hunger for understanding that fueled his steps through the library's hallowed halls. As he approached the section dedicated to Jinjutsu, he couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation. 
He decided to pick various Jinjutsu techniques available in the clan library. Since I am good at this stuff, it's best if I double down in it and maximize this opportunity. After hours of intense study, Renjiro chose a trio of Jinjutsu techniques that interested him. The first, Demonic Illusions, Binding of the Moon, a Uchiha clan speciality, distorted the victim's perception of time, subjecting them to an intense illusion within a fleeting moment. Renjiro saw its potential to disorient and incapacitate adversaries with its manipulation of time. The second, of his selections, Megan, Kyoka Suijetsu, Demonic Illusion, Mirror Flower, Water Moon, exploited the reflective capabilities of his Sharingan, allowing him to craft vivid illusions of dazzling flowers and serene water moons. This technique, adorned with beauty, concealed the danger within, serving as a potent tool for distraction and confusion. The third, Kokwanjio no Jutsu, Bringer of Darkness technique, plunged the target into absolute darkness, rendering them blind. Renjiro recognized the strategic value of disorienting opponents by shrouding them in darkness, leaving them vulnerable to unseen threats. In the quiet hall of the library, Renjiro marveled at the potential held within these scrolls. Each technique embodied his quest for mastery over Jinjutsu. This should be enough for now. It should keep me busy for a while before the next mission. After mastering the three Jinjutsu techniques, I should try integrating them into my fighting style. Maybe I could even try to create my own Jinjutsu technique. Leaving the library, the echoes of ancient knowledge resonating with every step, Renjiro looked forward to the journey ahead, eager to etch his name in the annals of Uchiha greatness through the captivating dance of illusions. I knew that the minute I talked about having enough time to practice my Jinjutsu, I was jinxing it. Renjiro grumbled as his footsteps echoed through the quiet corridors of the Hokage's office building. He couldn't shake off the feeling of frustration that gnawed at him. Yes, missions were all great and all, but he had been making leaps and bounds in his Jinjutsu training, and he just wanted to practice it and do nothing else. Next to him, Aiko and Hiro were not sharing the same sentiments as they were happy to go on another mission. The stark contrast between the trio's varying emotional responses to the situation was obvious. Aiko, noticing Renjiro's discontent, nudged him playfully. Cheer up, Renjiro. Missions keep us sharp, right? She remarked with an optimistic smile. Hiro, ever the enthusiast, added, yeah. Who knows what kind of exciting challenges we'll face this time. Renjiro shot them a half-hearted smile but couldn't shake off the nagging disappointment. But isn't it quite odd that we are going to the Hokage's office to get a brief about our mission? We usually just go to the mission center and select a mission. It seems things will be different. Renjiro thought as the trio entered the Hokage's office, where Riku was already in. To their surprise, they found Riku, their sensei, already present, along with two other Genin teams, Team 13 and Team 10. What are they doing here? Renjiro wondered when he saw Team 13 and Team 10. Ah, uh, Team 15, welcome, greeted Hiruzen, I've gathered you all here for a joint mission. Teams 10, 13, and 15 will be working together on this particular mission. A joint mission? This is new. Renjiro surmised. Riku nodded in acknowledgement, casting a brief glance towards his own team. The Genins from Team 10 and Team 13 exchanged polite nods and greetings with Team 15. Renjiro sized the other two teams up. He had heard of some of them since they all took the same Genin promotion exam. However, since they were not even in the same class back at the academy, they did not interact much after the exam. Team 10 was one specializing in tracking. Kurama Sando, a Jounin with a specialization in Jinjutsu, was the Yanni Sensei. The Jounin's presence exuded an air of confidence, and Renjiro couldn't help but wonder about the extent of his Jinjutsu expertise. Maybe I should ask him about Jinjutsu, I am sure his insights will help. But the fact that their clan fell by the time the story began showed how their Jinjutsu wasn't that powerful. Team 10 was stacked with skilled Genins with diverse abilities. One of them was Ono Inazuka who caught Renjiro's attention immediately. His Inazuka heritage was evident from the massive Nin Ken, Shuji, who stood proudly by his side. The size of Shuji suggested that this duo was not to be underestimated. Next in line was Fukui Hyuga, hailing from the branch family of the prestigious Hyuga clan. Despite being part of the branch family, 
Fukui's Byakugan was a potent asset that would undoubtedly contribute to the success of the mission. The unique abilities of the Hyuga clan, especially the Kekiai Genkai, made Fukui a valuable asset in reconnaissance and tracking. Completing Team 10 was Anze Aburame, a Kunoichi from the Aburame clan known for their connection with insects. The symbiotic relationship between Aburame Shinobi and their insect companions provided a distinct advantage in information gathering and tracking. An Aburame female? I haven't seen many of them around. She isn't carrying any gourd with her, so it's safe to say that the insects are in her body. Moving on to Team 13, the team was led by Goya Sarutobi, a Jounin renowned for her specialization in infiltration. As the leader of Team 13, Goya was adept at covert operations and had successfully employed her skills in various missions. Team 13's composition adhered to the traditional Inoshikacho formation, a time-honored trio that had proven its effectiveness over generations. The collaboration between the Yamanaka, Akimichi, and Nara clans was proven to be top-notch. Cho Akimichi, the robust and formidable member of the Akimichi clan, held the position of the Cho in the formation. His massive physique hinted at the immense strength and combat prowess that accompanied the members of his clan. Joining Cho was Iwai Yamanaka, representing the Ino in the formation. Hailing from the Yamanaka clan, Iwai possessed his clan's ability to utilize mind-based techniques, making him a valuable asset in reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. Completing the trio was Nakao Nara, the embodiment of the Th Nara in the Inoshikacho trio. As a member of the Nara clan, Nakao brought strategic brilliance and shadow manipulation to the team. The Nara clan's proficiency in shadow-based techniques contributed to their reputation as tactical geniuses, and Nakao was expected to uphold this legacy. A genin team made up of two kunoichis. I've never seen that before. I always thought that every genin cell had two males and a female shinobi. But then when I think about it, in Shikaku's generation, his genin team comprised of all males. Maybe the different clan cooperation bypasses this norm. Listen closely, Haruzan continued, his voice carrying a weight that demanded attention. Your mission is of utmost importance and requires your collective skills. We've received credible information that there's a potential threat to the land of Hot Water's Daimyo's son and his delegation to the land of Wheat. He paused, allowing the gravity of the situation to settle among the Jounins and Jenins. The delegation is currently in the land of Hot Water and is scheduled to travel to the land of Wheat. Your task is to ensure their safety during this journey as well as their stay in the land of Wheat. We suspect an assassination attempt, and it's imperative that you remain vigilant and prepared for any unforeseen circumstances. The Hokage's gaze shifted from one team to another, emphasizing the joint responsibility they bore. The land of hot water is your rendezvous point. Once you meet with the delegation, you will accompany them to the land of wheat, providing protection and thwarting any threats that may arise. The daimyo's son is under our protection, and we cannot afford any lapses in security. As Hiruzen concluded his briefing, he expressed his confidence in the team's abilities to carry out this mission. The Genin teams, aware of the gravity of their assignment, exchanged determined glances, ready to face the challenges that lay ahead. Before heading out, the teams began discussing strategies, strengths, and specialties. Riku engaged in a brief conversation with Sando and Goya, ensuring a clear understanding of each team's capabilities. With the mission parameters established, Teams 10, 13, and 15 left the Hokage's office. After final preparations, they headed out to the land of hot water, which was neighboring the land of fire. They swiftly traversed the familiar terrain of their home country. Upon reaching the land of hot water, the teams were directed to the location of the delegation they were tasked with protecting. The delegation, led by the daimyo's son, was engaged in diplomatic affairs that held crucial importance. The daimyo's son and his delegation were easily recognizable, dressed in ornate attire that distinguished them from the ordinary citizens in the bustling city. Goya Sarutobi of Team 15 took the lead, her experience in infiltration making her adept at such diplomatic encounters. With a bow, she greeted the daimyo's son and introduced the teams assigned to ensure their safety. The delegation, appreciative of Kanoha's commitment to their protection, reciprocated the gesture. The Genin were instructed on the delegation's itinerary, outlining key locations they would visit within the land of hot water before heading to the land of wheat. 
After a day's rest, they finally departed for the land of wheat. The Hokage's office was bathed in the dim glow as Hiruzen Sarutobi diligently worked through a mound of paperwork. The room echoed with the hushed sounds of distant city life, a stark contrast to the silence within the office. In the midst of his administrative responsibilities, a masked ANBU operative silently appeared in the room. The ANBU knelt before the Hokage, a symbol of reverence for the leader of Konoha. Hiruzen, glancing up from the scrolls and documents that consumed his desk, acknowledged the ANBU's presence. His voice carried the weight of authority as he spoke, report. The masked operative bowed respectfully before delivering the update, Hokage-sama, the three genin teams have successfully arrived in the land of hot water. They are currently making preparations to accompany the daimyo's son and his delegation towards their next destination. Hiruzen's gaze shifted to the window, the night sky outside shrouded in shadows. Contemplating the information, he questioned the ANBU further, how is the situation on the ground? Any signs of potential threats or disturbances? The ANBU responded with precision, thus far, Hokage-sama, all appears calm. The teams are maintaining a discreet presence, ensuring the safety of the delegation. Hiruzen nodded, his expression a blend of concern and confidence. Continue to monitor the situation closely. We cannot afford any lapses in security during this critical mission. The ANBU acknowledged the Hokage's directive, understood, Hokage-sama. With that, the masked operative faded back into the shadows, leaving the Hokage to his duties. As the ANBU departed, Hiruzen returned to the stack of paperwork before him. Hiruzen, why entrust such a crucial diplomatic mission to a group of Genin teams? You know that they will undoubtedly react to this. A lady who was also in the office with Hiruzen voiced her concerns to the Hokage in the quietude of his office. Her gaze was both questioning and speculative as she asked. The lady was in her early forties, her countenance marked by the subtle lines of experience and wisdom. Her features, though etched with the passage of time, reflect a keen intelligence and a no-nonsense demeanor. Her hair, once vibrant, now carries streaks of silver, further underscoring her years of service to Konoha. With piercing eyes that convey both scrutiny and discernment, she possessed an unwavering presence that commanded respect. Hiruzen, unfazed by the lady's skepticism, regarded her with a measured expression. Koharu, my decision was not made lightly. I know what's at stake. Besides, I've already anticipated potential reactions and implemented countermeasures. Koharu arched an eyebrow, her skepticism lingering. Countermeasures? Are you certain they will be enough? This is a precarious situation, and we cannot afford any missteps. Hiruzen folded his hands contemplatively. Rest assured, Koharu. I have taken every precaution. The genins assigned to this mission may be young, but they have proven themselves capable in their previous endeavors. This mission is an opportunity for them to demonstrate their growth and adaptability. That is if everything goes well. Koharu's gaze remained discerning, but she relented, acknowledging the Hokage's confidence. Very well, Hiruzen. But keep in mind, if the negotiations break, war might be on the horizon. Hiruzen nodded, understanding the weight of the situation. I am well aware, Koharu. The journey to the land of wheat unfolded at a deliberately measured pace with the teams adapting to the rhythm of the delegation. The road stretched ahead, winding through landscapes of varying hues, and the teams maintained a vigilant watch over the delegation's safety. As the miles passed beneath their feet, Renjiro couldn't help but feel a tinge of restlessness. The journey, while uneventful, held an air of cautious anticipation. While the pace of the journey may have seemed slow, it provided ample time for the genins to reflect on the gravity of their responsibilities. Thankfully, it did not take long for their destination to come to view. As the land of wheat unfolded before the delegation and the accompanying shinobi teams, they quickly made their way to the bustling city of Harukawa, the capital city. The vibrant cityscape teemed with life, its architecture blending tradition with modernity, creating a lively tapestry of colors and sounds. The ruling council welcomed the daimyo's son and his entourage, leading them into the heart of Harukawa where the negotiation talks would be held. The shinobi observed the city's unique charm with a mix of curiosity and appreciation. The streets were adorned with banners and decorations, setting the stage for an upcoming festival. 
the aroma of diverse cuisines wafted through the air, enticing both locals and visitors alike. The festival they were preparing for was the Golden Crop Festival. The ruling council extended invitations to the shinobi teams to partake in the festivities. Harukawa's festivals were renowned for their lively atmosphere, captivating performances, and an abundance of activities. The prospect of immersing themselves in the cultural richness of the land of wheat resonated with the genin. However, due to the nature of the mission, this was not possible. As much as the genins concentrated on their patrols as the negotiation talks were going on, they could not help but turn their attention to the festival and its preparations. The Golden Crop Festival was due to the bountiful harvest that they had received. In a world where there were always wars and other dry lands like the Land of Wind, Bountiful Harvest was a source of revenues to minor nations such as them as it helped boost their economies as well as receive shinobi services. The festivities began with a vibrant tapestry of colors and various festivities, painting the landscape with the hues of celebration. The festival grounds were adorned with an array of stalls and booths, each offering a cornucopia of delights. The scent of freshly baked bread, savory treats, and the sweetness of pastries wafted through the air, creating an aromatic medley that beckoned to all attendees. Colorful banners fluttered in the breeze, their designs reflecting the agricultural richness of the land. Amidst the revelry, locals donned traditional attires, adding a kaleidoscope of patterns and textures to the lively scene. Renjiro observed intricately woven fabrics and garments, each telling a story of the region's cultural heritage. The genins found themselves enchanted by the rhythmic beats of traditional music, the lively melodies resonating with the spirit of the festival. The heart of the celebration lay in the center square, where a grand stage hosted performances showcasing the talents of local artists. Dancers adorned in golden hues gracefully moved to the music, their movements embodying the essence of the festival. Spectators gathered, their faces adorned with smiles and laughter, as they reveled in the joyous atmosphere. Stalls displayed an array of agricultural products, the pride of the land of wheat. Golden grains, ripe fruits, and freshly harvested vegetables were showcased with meticulous care, paying homage to the fruitful yield of the season. As the sun dipped below the horizon, lanterns were lit, casting a warm and golden glow upon the festival grounds. The atmosphere became enchanted, the flickering lights creating a magical ambience. Unfortunately, the joyous atmosphere of the festival took an abrupt turn as a sudden disturbance cast a shadow over the vibrant celebration. The air, once filled with laughter and music, now resonated with panicked shouts and the buzzing of an unexpected threat. A dark cloud descended upon the festival grounds, but it wasn't the looming night sky. Instead, it was a swarm of relentless insects, their presence heralding chaos. A few minutes earlier, perched on an elevated vantage point, a group of four shinobis observed the lively scene unfolding below with its vibrant colors, music, and the anticipation of a joyous celebration. The group comprised of three males and one lady. Cloaked in maroon attire that blended with the shadows and adorned with brown flak jackets, the group of four shinobi remained inconspicuous amidst the festival's vibrant atmosphere. Their choice of clothing was not only a clear indication of what village they came from but also a strategic decision as the dull colors helped them to seamlessly meld with the darkness. The leader of the group, a man with an air of authority, glanced toward Akunoichi, who was the group's censor, awaiting her crucial update. The man inquired, what's the update? The Kunoichi swiftly relayed her findings. The three Jounins are in close proximity to the negotiation hall. We need a diversion to draw their attention away from that area, she reported her voice low and measured. The leader, aware of the delicate nature of their mission, pondered the situation. He then responded, a diversion hmm? Let me take care of that. He took a step forward, signaling his intent to handle the diversion part personally. With a fluid and practiced motion, he formed a hand seal and bellowed, Bees arts, be wrath. In response to his command, a swarm of bees materialized, their origin seemingly from a huge gourd on the shinobi's back. The bees, agitated and ready to execute their master's bidding, surged forward with a frenetic energy. The swarm descended upon the unsuspecting civilians like a dark cloud, disrupting the joyful atmosphere of the festival. Panic ensued as the bees began to attack the festival-goers with relentless fury. 
Present time, the night in Harukawa was enveloped in an eerie ambience Renjiro, together with Anze Aburame, moved with a silent vigilance through Harukawa streets. The duo was part of a larger force, consisting of nine genins tasked with patrolling the city in pairs, except for Team 15, who navigated the night as a trio. Hiro and Ono Inazuka, Aiko and Fukui Hyuga, and the rest of the genins navigated the city in their designated groups, creating a web of surveillance that aimed to catch any potential threats in its threads. Renjiro's Sharingan eyes glowed softly in the darkness, attuned to detecting any subtle disturbances in the surroundings. Anze moved with a quiet confidence, her insect companions serving as an additional set of eyes and ears. Silence prevailed, occasionally interrupted by the distant sounds of the city at night. Seeing the awkward silence Renjiro wanted to engage in conversation to learn more about her. Renjiro casually remarked, so bugs, huh? The words lingered in the air, awaiting Anze's response. Renjiro anticipated a response. However, before Anze could answer, her demeanor shifted. Her gaze was fixed on a distant point. Something is coming. Get ready, Anze announced with an urgency that cut through the night air. The shift in her tone and the alertness in her eyes made it clear that whatever approached demanded their immediate attention. Renjiro shifted into alert mode, his senses heightened as he activated his chakra field. Curious and slightly perplexed, Renjiro turned to Anze Aburame and inquired, what's coming? The decision to deactivate his chakra field had been intentional from Sando's earlier instructions. The reports of potential assassination attempts had prompted caution, they wanted to bait the enemy and lure them out. Anze, with a furrowed brow, responded to Renjiro's question. Wait, is this correct? Insects? Bees? They're coming, she said, her tone revealing a mix of uncertainty and concern. What do you mean bees? Renjiro asked. What else is there to explain? Bees are coming. Anze replied as they both headed to civilians who were screaming from the agony of the bees' attacks. Unfortunately, the chaos intensified when Renjiro and Anze sprang into action. She utilized her ability to control and communicate with insects and directed her bugs to assist in aiding the nearby civilians. The civilians, in the midst of confusion and panic, mistook the Aburame's insect manipulation for an attack. Their cries of distress echoed through the festival grounds, amplifying the atmosphere of chaos. The misunderstanding exacerbated the situation, as fear and paranoia swept through the crowd like wildfire. Renjiro, recognizing the need to defuse the tension, raised his hands in a gesture of non-aggression. Calm down, we're here to help, he shouted, trying to make himself heard over the commotion. Anze, too, attempted to reassure the civilians, urging them to remain calm amidst the turmoil. Probably telling them to calm down now won't help. Renjiro swiftly executed a body flicker technique, appearing beside the startled civilians. He flickered some of them away causing the civilians to blink and find themselves at a safer distance from the perceived threat. Along with Anze, they both did so until all the civilians were safe from danger. Since they could now face the swarm of bees without worrying about the civilians, Renjiro decided to utilize a fire jutsu, hoping to showcase their ability to control the situation. Fire release, greater fireball jutsu, he muttered, conjuring a burst of intense flames that danced in the night sky heading to the bees. The jutsu was similar to the first fire release jutsu he had learned. The only difference was that it allowed for more chakra to be channeled into it, supercharging it, and making the size way larger. However, Anze, with her expertise in the Aburame clan's techniques, informed him that fire held no threat to them. Her own insects were immune to fire, so the bees too would be. It was a great misconception that clans that used insect techniques would have a major weakness against fire. There was some truth in this as before that was the case. However, such clans had trained their Kikachu to be fire resistant. At least to some extent. Hmm? Something is wrong. Back at the hall where the negotiations were being held, Riku thought. The trio of Jounins, having noticed the sudden turmoil in the festival below, found themselves at a crossroads. The urgency of the situation was evident, but they were unsure of whether they should intervene immediately or adhere to their original mission of safeguarding the delegation. In the midst of their contemplation, the unexpected occurred. For mysterious shinobi, each a jounin like themselves, appeared before them. What the he-sando wondered. 
Without warning, the attackers initiated an assault, catching the Kanoha Jounins off guard. They faced off against the assailants who had been a part of the group that unleashed the swarm of insects upon the festival. Among these attackers, the leader, who had earlier initiated the B-Wrath Jutsu, observed the skirmish with an air of nonchalance. His demeanor suggested an eerie calmness, standing casually as if the ongoing battle held no significance for him. The three Jounins, Riku, Sando, and Goya, engaged in combat with the assailants. However, the leader of the opposing group refrained from direct involvement, content to let his subordinates take on the task of confronting the Kanoha Jounins. Kaya Kamazuru. What the hell is IWA thinking by deploying an S-rank ninja in a minor village? Riku wondered when he managed to sneak a glance at the shinobi while fighting an IWA Jounin. S-rank ninjas stood at the pinnacle of strength and skill within the shinobi world. Beyond the raw power they wield, these elite shinobis are considered strategic assets, often serving as a deterrence to potential threats to a nation or a shinobi village to be specific. Second only to the immense power of tailed beasts, S-rank ninjas possess capabilities that can tip the scales in favor of their villages during times of conflict. Their skills and prowess make them Kage level, and any one of them is deemed suitable to ascend to the position of village leader. That was why Riku was surprised to see Kaya Kamazuru here. He was widely known as one of the few S-rank shinobi from Iwagakure in the ninja data book. Just like the first Tsuchikage, who also originated from the Kamazuru clan, Kaya was very adept in his clan's jutsu, and the versatility he wielded the jutsus put him in a league of his own. However, Kaya himself felt the weight of the mission bearing down on his shoulders, he couldn't shake the anxiety that gnawed at the edges of his composure. Inasmuch as he appeared nonchalant on the outside, the situation was quite the opposite on the inside. The delicate balance of power between two of the major nations hung in the balance, and the success or failure of their mission would echo far beyond the immediate objectives. His main objective was to ensure that the land of hot water and wheat did not enter into any kind of treaty. This was because any type of collaboration between the two would spell disaster for Iwagakure and the land of earth as a whole. The land of wheat was one of the nations neighboring the land of earth, where Iwagakure was located, on the south. If the two minor nations collaborated, then Kanoha, which was a huge backer behind the land of hot water, would use that as a way to move forces to attack Iwagakure. Anoki had carefully outlined the gravity of the situation to Kaya, emphasizing that any advantage gained by Kanoha in these negotiations could tip the scales unfavorably for Iwagakure in the shadow of an imminent conflict. This was a potential opening he could not afford to leave to Hiruzen. In the realm of shinobi politics, the prospect of peace was often a fleeting illusion, a momentary respite between the storms of war. All Kages, shaped by the harsh realities of their world, understood that preparing for the next conflict was not a matter of choice but a strategic necessity. Peaceful times provided the opportunity to strengthen one's military might, forge alliances, and gather intelligence, all in anticipation of the inevitable clashes that defined the shinobi landscape. The seemingly paradoxical nature of preparing for war during times of peace was the harsh reality of their existence. Shinobi, like tools, only served to push the various agendas of their feudal lords as well as other powers. Kaya grew increasingly frustrated with all that was happening. This was only supposed to be a quick in and out assassination mission, but it had now transformed into a chaotic spectacle. Deal with the delegation swiftly. I'll handle them, Kaya commanded, his tone unyielding and focused. His subordinates nodded in acknowledgement and moved with determined purpose toward the negotiation hall, leaving Kaya to confront the formidable Kanoha Jounins. Sando, Riku, and Goya met Kaya's gaze with unwavering determination, understanding that the success of their mission hinged on thwarting the IWA shinobi leader. Kaya took a step forward, his expression a mix of resolve and disdain. Kanoha shinobi meddling in affairs beyond their borders. A mistake you won't live to regret, he declared. Riku, calm despite the brewing storm, responded, isn't that what you are also doing? Why don't we end this charade and get to the best part? True, but this is as far as you go, Kaya declared, his voice cutting through like a blade. We'll see about that. Back at the city grounds, Renjiro and Anze had long realized that attempting to vanquish the relentless swarm head-on was futile. 
Instead, they shifted their focus to protecting the civilians and guiding them away from the imminent danger. Working in tandem, Renjiro and Anze utilized their respective abilities to direct the swarm away from the panicked crowd. Since containment was essential, Renjiro and Anze decided to regroup with the other genins. With their immediate objective being the safety of the civilians, the two shinobi raced towards the other genins who were tasked with patrolling the city. Renjiro and Anze swiftly moved toward the concentrated source of the buzzing swarm, guided by their keen senses. As they approached, it became evident that the other genins had also discerned the strategic importance of the location, creating a makeshift group to counter the insect onslaught. Despite the chaos surrounding them, forming a formidable line against the relentless insect onslaught was important. In between the fights, Hiro's curiosity was piqued, causing him to direct a question to Anze, is this some rogue aburame causing all of this chaos? He was, trying to make sense of the situation. Fukai chimed in, these are bees, not the usual insects used by the Aburame clan. It's something else entirely. Anze, processing the unfolding events, shared her knowledge with the group, this isn't the work of any Aburame clan member. The only other clan known for manipulating insects like this is the Kamazuru clan from IWA. Their affinity for controlling bees is infamous. The Genins exchanged glances, realizing the gravity of the situation. Aiko added, so, we're dealing with a person from the Kamazuru clan? IWA? Why are they moving against Kanoha? Renjiro wondered. He was not interested in the political ins and outs of the shinobi world, but even someone like him could figure out that something like this could potentially have dangerous consequences. Fukai, sensing the tension, suggested, let's focus on containing the swarm and ensuring the safety of the civilians. We can worry about the Kamazuru later. Right now, this should be our priority. Then again, they could always claim that the Kamazuru shinobi was rogue to keep their hands clean of this mess they are causing. Anze asserted, to effectively deal with the bees, we need to find the user and confront them directly. The Aburame and Kamazuru clans have been rivals for as long as we can remember, so of course, we have come up with ways to counter them. True. But since our senseis have not come to help, that could only mean one of two things. First, they think that we are able to handle this hence they need to safeguard the delegation. Two, they might be engaging the Kamazuru shinobi. Most likely, it is the latter since none of us have encountered them after the attack started. Nakao Nara finally contributed. She had been silent ever since the Genins regrouped. She took her time to analyze the situations from different perspectives. Once she concluded her analysis she shared it with the group. But that would mean that the enemy is a Jounin at the very least. If they are, then the best we could do is just keep the civilians from harm and hope our senseis handle this matter. Catching up on what Nakao said, Cho Akimichi added. This is going to be tough, Renjiro surmised. Sando swiftly initiated the assault, his hands forming the rat seal with practice precision. Megan, Narakumi no Jutsu, he exclaimed, the words resonating through the air. The atmosphere around Kaya seemed to ripple briefly as the Genjutsu took effect. The technique unfolded like a sinister dance, a circle of leaves spinning and enveloping Kaya before gently falling away. From an outsider's perspective, the world appeared unchanged, but within the confines of the Genjutsu, a nightmarish vision awaited. The Genjutsu used, demonic illusion, hell viewing technique, was a D-ranked Genjutsu that caused its target to see a horrifying vision. The user would use the rat hand seal to cause a circle of leaves to spin and envelop the target and then fall away. Once cast, the world will appear normal to the target until they see the illusion. It was a trivial genjutsu barely useful in hurting opponents. The only reason Sando decided to use it with the Jounins having no issues was because they knew that this trivial genjutsu was a powerful weapon when used by Kurama Sando. Sando's proficiency in genjutsu wasn't merely a product of his training. It was in his blood as a member of the esteemed Kurama clan. The Kurama clan was renowned for their mastery of Genjutsu and had produced several exceptional shinobi throughout history. What made them one of Kanoha's most dangerous clans, was their Kekiai Genkai. Their Kekiai Genkai entailed enabling the clan members with the ability to have a Genjutsu so powerful that it causes the brain of the target to believe anything that happens to the victim to the point where the Genjutsu physically harms the victim's body in the same manner they envisioned. 
However, while the Kekiai Genkai was great, its drawbacks were equally impactful. The users were equally rarely able to control the full extent of their abilities, resulting in their subconscious regulating that power, leading to the creation of a second personality in control of that power. That was why Sando always used E-ranked and below Jinjutsus to incapacitate his targets. With Sando being one of the few members of his clan with this Kekiai Genkai, he quickly one of the best Jinjutsu experts in the village. Yet, to the surprise of the Kanoha trio, Kaya stood resolute, unaffected by the Jinjutsu's intended horrors. His eyes betrayed no sign of distress as he calmly observed the environment. Is this pesky mirage what you call a Jinjutsu? Kaya asked as he caught something behind him. Sando quickly came into view on Kaya's hold. Let me show you the real deal. In response to Kaya's contemptuous remark, Sando felt the sting of the unknown substance as it struck his face. The viscous material clung to his face. However, before he could fully comprehend the situation, Kaya retaliated with a swift and unexpected maneuver. With a sudden surge of chakra, Kaya deftly wove a Jinjutsu of his own, ensnaring Sando's senses in it. The world around Sando was twisted and distorted. As the Jinjutsu took hold, the environment became a surreal landscape. Caught within the Jinjutsu, Sando struggled to discern reality from fiction. The disorienting effects of the Jinjutsu made him vulnerable, and in that moment of vulnerability, swift as a shadow, Kaya drove a kunai into Sando's midriff. The sudden pain and the shock of the unexpected attack Jared Sando's relieving him from the Jinjutsu. However, he left one world of pain only to enter another one. He grunted, feeling the cold metal pierce his flesh. As Sando executed the rat hand seal to cast the Jinjutsu, the swarm of bees Kaya had released to the environment responded to the disturbance of Sando's chakra. Swift as a reflex, Kaya's connection with the hive allowed him to interpret their signals. With efficiency, Kaya disrupted his chakra flow, creating interference that negated the Jinjutsu's intended effect. Instead, Kaya seized the opportunity to turn the tide. With Sando unsuspecting, Kaya launched a surprise attack, spitting forth an unknown substance on his face. The liquid was his hive's very own mead. The liquid dulled Sando's senses making it easy for Kaya to use the pheromones released by the hive to entrap Sando in a Jinjutsu before stabbing him with a kunai. It was unfortunate as Sando had gone down on the very sword he used to shine. Meanwhile, Riku and Gia were both surprised to see this. What the hell happened? It was a sure bet that he would fall into Sando's Jinjutsu. He is an S-ranked ninja, I should not have expected things to be that easy. Goya tried to process the situation while preparing herself for the inevitable clash. With Sando out of commission, it would be hard dealing with the beekeeper. With a nod, Goya and Riku moved to orchestrate a symphony of destruction, each jutsu harmonizing with the other to create a relentless barrage. Goya employed fire-release jutsu such as searing migraine, while Riku employed wind jutsus like the great breakthrough jutsu to amplify Goya's attacks. Kaya, recognizing the overwhelming power arrayed against him, summoned his swarm of bees as a protective shield. The insects, an extension of his will, buzzed around him like a living fortress, intercepting the fiery tempest and shielding him from the earthen onslaught. However, even the Kamazuru leader couldn't deny the sheer force of the combined attacks. The bees valiantly withstood the assault, yet the strain was evident. As the battle unfolded, Kaya's strategic mind sought an avenue of escape from the relentless assault. His nimble movements allowed him to evade the more devastating blows, but the sustained pressure. They are coming on strong. I need to change the flow of the battle. Yes, he was an S-ranked ninja, but all that stemmed from the fact that his bees were very versatile. Against a vicious onslaught from the two Kanoha Jounins, he was in a tight spot. Beeswax clone. Drawing his chakra, Kaya crafted a clone from beeswax. The clone joined its creator on the battlefield. Now bolstered by this ally, Kaya seized the opportunity to turn the tide. The duo launched a barrage of coordinated counterattacks. Goya and Riku, momentarily caught off guard by the sudden shift in the battle, found themselves forced into a defensive position. Unfortunately for Kaya, the temporary respite provided by his clone was short-lived. Goya, unleashed a scorching fire jutsu, targeting the clone, engulfing it in flames that, well melted it. As the fiery demise of his clone unfolded, Kaya's attention wavered for a moment. 
Seizing the opportunity, Riku exploited the opening. With a sequence of hand seals, the very earth beneath Kaya's feet responded to the Jounin's command. Dotan Kekai, Doradamu. Dungeon Chamber of Nothingness, the Jutsu manifested as a formidable prison around Kaya. A self-repairing dome encased the IWA Shinobi, leaving him confined within a chamber of unyielding earth. Inside the dome, Kaya found himself in an inescapable embrace of the earth. Attempts to break free were met with the unyielding resistance of the barrier. The relentless attacks from the Kanoha Jounins had culminated in a moment of tactical brilliance, trapping the IWA Shinobi within the confines of a dome. Why are they so stubborn? I guess I have to use that. Although it's chakra intensive, it's my only option. With resolve, Kaya decided to use his trump card. With a tremor, Kaya shattered the earth dome, emerging clad in some sort of armor. Observing Kaya's resurgence, Riku turned to Goya. Goya, ensure the safety of the delegation. I'll hold him off. Riku, it's been hard taking him on with just the two of US Dash, we don't have any other option Goya, Riku interrupted Goya, understanding the urgency of the situation, nodded affirmatively. Riku prepared to face Kaya head on. Meanwhile, Goya hastened towards the delegation hall. Upon entering the delegation hall, Goya surveyed the scene to ensure the safety of the land of wheat and hot water representatives. What are they doing here? Goya wondered as she could not believe what she was seeing. Back to Riku and Kaya's clash, both shinobis were on the verge of collapsing. Kaya's chakra reserves were nearly depleted, and the strain of maintaining his armor was taking a toll. On the other side, Riku, despite having larger reserves, suffered from injuries inflicted by Kaya during their confrontation. Kaya's armor was a result of using his hive's exoskeleton. His bees were a variant that evolved from crossbreeding bees and Baikochu insects. They had stung Kaya and used their exoskeleton to form the armor covering Kaya. The armor increased his overall physical capabilities beyond what Chakra normally could do. With one of them with great physical capabilities and other with a greater Chakra reserve forced the battle to turn to one of attrition. Riku was taking the brunt of Kaya's attack while Kaya was taking a hit on his reserves. In the midst of the struggle, Riku managed to deliver the final blow to Kaya, forcing him to collapse under the weight of chakra exhaustion. As Kaya fell, Riku faced the same fate as he too, gave in to his injuries. As Riku collapsed, a mysterious figure emerged. The silhouette stepped forward. The stranger approached Riku's unconscious form. What are they doing here? Goya wondered as she could not believe what she was seeing. Her eyes widened in surprise as she entered the negotiation hall, expecting to find land of wheat shinobis fighting against the IWA Jounins. Instead, she was met with a scene of unexpected collaboration between them and some of the Jenins. Renjiro, Fukui Hyuga, and even her own Jenin, Cho Akimichi, were actively engaged in a coordinated effort to assist the shinobis from the land of wheat against the IWA Jounins. This was a surprise as she had expected the nine Jenins, that they came with, to focus on the civilians. Besides keeping the civilians safe, it was a dangerous situation for them to be in as they would be more of a liability than help. They've already killed some nobles from both sides. I need to contain them. Goya quickly assessed the situation. With a sense of urgency, she joined their efforts, ready to lend her skills to the collective goal of thwarting the IWA Shinobi's plans. Finally, Goya has arrived. Renjiro was very happy that one of their Jounins had arrived because holding the IWA Shinobis off was very hard. Still, it was a noble effort considering that they were Jenins, although they were taking on a supportive role. Back when the Jenins were still trying to contain the hive threat, their senses were heightened by the urgency of the situation and Renjiro detected the escalating conflict involving their senseis and the IWA group. Fukui's Byakugan only served to confirm Renjiro's observations, providing an enhanced perspective on the unfolding events. Renjiro turned to the rest. Our senseis are fighting someone. Someone very powerful. We need to go and safeguard the delegation, he declared, his voice carrying a sense of urgency. Fukui nodded, his Byakugan was still active, scanning the area for any information that they could use. I agree. Let's go, but be cautious. We don't know the full extent of the enemy ninja's abilities, he cautioned. Since not all of them could go, only Renjiro, Fukui and Cho would be going, 
leaving the rest to contain the bees as they were still running rampant. They quickly left and headed to where the fight was. They saw their senseis engaged with an IWA shinobi. They knew their limits and decided to head into the hall. The sight that met their eyes was one of chaos, with IWA ninjas overwhelming the defenders from the land of wheat. Without hesitation, Renjiro, Fukui, and Cho coordinated their efforts, each selecting an opponent to engage and support the defenders. Renjiro and Fukui swiftly integrated into the ongoing battle at the negotiation hall, aligning their efforts with a seasoned Jounin from the land of wheat to confront the IWA ninja before them. In a rapid flurry of precise strikes, Fukui initiated the 8 trigram 64 palms, a renowned Hyuga clan technique designed to incapacitate opponents by blocking their chakra points. However, Fukui's execution was still in the process of refinement, and the IWA shinobi, sensing the incoming assault, swiftly reacted. As Fukui's palms moved with calculated speed, aiming to intercept and seal the chakra points of his adversary, the IWA shinobi demonstrated impressive taijutsu skills. Swiftly dodging and parrying Fukui's attacks, he countered with a series of well-timed strikes, disrupting the flow of the eight trigrams. Despite Fukui's dedication to the technique, the IWA shinobi's relentless assault proved formidable. The wheat shinobi, recognizing the opening created by Fukui's commitment to the eight trigrams, seized the opportunity. With a calculated strike, he incapacitated the IWA shinobi. They had just finished off the IWA shinobi when Goya entered the hall. Together, they turned their attention towards the remaining two IWA jounins. Goya swiftly closed the distance between herself and the female IWA Jounin. In a seamless blend of agility and precision, she joined the fray, adding her formidable skills to the mix. The battle intensified as the shinobi clashed in a flurry of jutsu and taijutsu, each move calculated to gain the upper hand. As the skirmish unfolded, it did not take time before they collectively dispatched the enemy shinobis. In the aftermath of the battle, the toll on both delegations became increasingly evident. The clash between the Land of Wheat and IWA Shinobi had unintended consequences, resulting in casualties from both sides. Unfortunately, the group briskly made their way outside. Riku was still fighting Kaya, and the urgency of the situation compelled them to intervene in the ongoing struggle. Hmm? Is that Tsunade? Renjiro thought immediately as they saw Tsunade tending to both Sando and Riku's injuries. Despite knowing of her, there was something about her presence as one of the Sanans that left him momentarily awestruck. She emanated an aura of strength and experience. Tsunade's long, blonde hair cascaded down her back, framing a face marked by both wisdom and the indomitable spirit that defined her reputation. Her attire was the usual Jonan outfit which was a contrast to what Renjiro saw her in back when he was watching the series. Her presence is completely different from Hiruzen's. While the latter's is gentle and welcoming, hers is a bit ferocious. Tsunade, her hands still immersed in healing Karama Sando, who was at death's door, cast a discerning gaze at the trio of Jenin standing before her. The intensity of her gaze seemed to pierce through their thoughts. It seems she still hasn't developed her phobia for blood. What are you lot gawking at? She quipped her tone a blend of authority and mild amusement. This isn't a sightseeing tour, if you're going to stand there, you might as well be useful. Renjiro, Fukui, and Cho exchanged glances before Renjiro, taking a step forward, cleared his throat. Apologies, Tsunadesima, we were just, impressed. Tsunade chuckled, her eyes softening momentarily. Impressed? Huh? Well, I don't need a fan club. I need helping hands. If you're done staring, help me move these two to a better spot for treatment. The Jenins, spurred into action by her straightforward command, approached Riku and Sando. Gently, they assisted Tsunade in relocating the injured shinobi to a slightly more sheltered area. Riku has always been careless. That damn kid. Why did he feel the need to fight an S-rank shinobi? I should have gotten here sooner. I am sure Sensei will give me an earful. The Senju princess thought. Once the wounded were stabilized, Goya turned to Tsunade with a question that lingered in his mind. Tsunade-sama, why are you here? Was there more to this mission? Tsunade looked up, Lord Third had anticipated that IWA would not react kindly to this and that they could have sent a larger force so he sent me here just in case. But I got distracted along the way because of. 
Some herbs I saw. Liar I am sure she was in a gambling den. Rinjiro could not help but think when he noticed the look on her face. Anyway, with them even attacking nobles from the land of wheat, they just fastened the collaboration between the two nations, Goya remarked. With some of the ruling class from the land of wheat being among the collateral damage in the attack, IWA angered their neighbors. Despite them being a minor nation, they could still give in to Kanoha's proposition in a bid to punish the land of earth. Renjiro noticed the IWAS ranked shinobi's body lying around. He wasn't dead. He lost his consciousness while fighting Riku, most likely due to chakra loss. Goya Sensei, what should we do with him? He asked pointing at Kaya. Noticing this, Goya slit Kaya's throat ending his life. He was more dangerous alive than dead. Besides, the Yamanaka clan could read his memories and get vital information. Reading memories of a shinobi of such a caliber would give Konoha a lot of intel on the operations of Iwagakure. In a world where war could break at any moment, such information would be almost invaluable. I killed him to break the connection to his hive, Goya explained, without Kaya, the bees will die off, and the threat will be neutralized. Make it easier for the rest. Understanding the tactical necessity behind Goya's choice, Renjiro nodded in agreement. She then asked Renjiro to seal Kaya Kamazuru's lifeless body into a scroll as per usual, a process that had become a routine part of his shinobi duties. The scroll was handed over to Goya with a firm yet somber expression. Renjiro didn't know why, but he sealed a few of Kaya's bees in his storage seals. He wanted to study them later. After that, civilian casualties became the immediate priority. One thing that Kaya had forgotten to mention was that after crossbreeding his bees with the Bikachu, they not only got the exoskeleton ability, but they also started producing venom on their stings. This was bad as now most of the civilians were in danger of poisoning. It could have gone unnoticed but thanks to Tsunade's keen eyes for such things, they were able to notice it early and attend to it. Tsunade began triaging the patients, swiftly categorizing them based on the severity of their injuries. She spared no time in evaluating the genin's capabilities, observing their chakra control and assigning them tasks accordingly. Renjiro found himself paired up with an Akao. They were handed the responsibility of monitoring a group of patients. Tsunade's instructions were clear, observe their vitals, ensure their wounds were stable, and report any changes immediately. The wounded varied in severity, from minor scrapes and bruises due to the stampede caused while they tried to escape to more critical injuries. The Genins, guided by Tsunade's expertise, checked bandages, assessed vital signs, and offered comfort to the injured. Tsunade offered occasional nods of approval, silently acknowledging their efforts. The medical nin's aura of competence and resilience seemed to infuse the atmosphere with a sense of order amid the chaos. Renjiro, while not a stranger to the aftermath of battles, couldn't help but marvel at Tsunade's ability to navigate the intricate dance between life and death with such poise. In the aftermath of the confrontation, the village slowly began to regain a semblance of normalcy. The only good thing to come out of this was that both the ruling powers of the Land of Wheat and the Land of Hot Water agreed on a treaty and would work with Kanoha against IWA. The way Lord Hokage schemes and actually succeeds is frightening. He is a capable shinobi and also a strategist. I wouldn't want to be on his bad side. Renjiro was surprised that Hiruzen's plan had worked nearly perfectly. But if he is such a schemer why the hell did he put the Uchiha in a compromised situation for them to plan a coup? Because I am sure he could have seen this happening from a mile away and actually solved it. Anyway, I just hope when the time reaches, I will be strong enough to change things or at the very least, protect myself. Rinjiro shrugged as they prepared to go back to the village. They would have to go back to the land of hot water to take the delegation back. The team moved in a loose formation. Sando, with a bandaged midriff, moved with a noticeable but determined limp. Riku still exhibited physical fatigue, a testament to the toll of the wounds on his body. Renjiro and the Genin contingent trailed behind their senseis. Even with them not moving fast, they were able to complete the mission and get back to the village. The minute they arrived, Riku informed them that they would be taking a break as he recovered from his injuries. I probably expected for him to get a stand-in Jounin sensei while he recovers but a break would also help I need to work on a few things. 
During the break, Renjiro seized the opportunity to delve deeper into his own style of combat by creating a weapon technique that complemented his skills and temperament. With a staff in hand, Renjiro meticulously practiced his weapon art consisting of evasion and dodging strikes. His movements were fluid, an intricate dance that wove through the air with calculated grace. The staff became an extension of his body, a tool not just for striking but also for deflecting and parrying. The style Renjiro crafted was rooted in agility and adaptability. He focused on swift footwork, allowing him to seamlessly navigate the battlefield, avoiding attacks with minimal effort. Each step, each twist of the staff, was a manifestation of his intent to master the finesse of evasion. He explored the possibilities of redirection and counterattacks, turning the basic staff into an instrument of defense and offense. The simplicity of evasion, the art of avoiding conflict as much as engaging in it, formed the backbone of his newly forged style. He would have loved to explore more offense capabilities of his weapon but he didn't due to the lack of poison and a perfect genjutsu to use along with the staff. This is frustrating. If I don't get a perfect genjutsu fit for this, then I will have to create one for myself. But that is a tall order because I don't even know how to create my own ninjutsu. At least not yet. Maybe I should try and alter some genjutsu? Luckily for him, Miwa was around and he consulted her for some advice. Under her guidance, he delved into the arsenal of genjutsu techniques that the Uchiha bloodline offered. The two fundamental techniques, genjutsu, Sharingan and Megan, Kaiten Chiten, Demonic Illusion, Mirror Heaven and Earth Change, became the focal points of his study. As Renjiro practiced the basic genjutsu of his Sharingan, Miwa's instructions echoed in his mind. By establishing eye contact with an opponent, the genjutsu would activate causing momentary lapses in consciousness or inducing temporary paralysis. The Megan, Kaiten Chiten, a more advanced technique, required Renjiro to harness the copy and counter abilities of the Sharingan. It was a delicate interplay of perception and manipulation, where the user reversed an incoming genjutsu, turning the tables on the original caster. Hmm, it's basically an Uno reverse card for anyone trying to trap me in a genjutsu. The concept fascinated Renjiro, but the complexity of execution meant that it would be hard to master. Renjiro's awareness of these techniques, coupled with his cautious approach, led him to refrain from self-guided practice. The potential risks associated with unsupervised attempts at such advanced techniques were evident. Other than that, immediately after Riku got better, they went on a marathon of missions. The first one was a herbal collection mission where the team had to collect rare medicinal herbs from a remote forest to replenish the village's medical supplies. They meticulously identified rare medicinal herbs and skillfully cleared foliage. The team's coordination and individual strengths culminated in a successful mission. Pouches filled, they emerged from the forest, a cohesive unit with a mission accomplished. Things continued like this for the better part of the year and it became a whirlwind of challenges and growth for Team 15, as they navigated through various missions that tested their mettle against bandits and unruly elements. Despite the weariness, due to the same types of missions that settled in after the fifth mission, Riku's mindset propelled them forward, choosing missions that would further hone their skills. As the team's battle experiences grew with each encounter, the Genins found themselves adapting to diverse combat scenarios. Riku, recognizing the importance of practical experience, kept the team on a rigorous schedule. The trials against bandits became a crucible that forged them into a formidable unit, each member contributing their unique strengths to overcome the challenges thrown their way. The bandit confrontations not only tested their combat prowess but also strengthened their camaraderie. The weariness that initially clung to them transformed into a resilient spirit, fueling their determination. The passing year became a testament to their growth which was good considering it was now time for the Chunin exams. The early morning sun cast a soft glow over training ground 51 as Team 15 assembled, anticipating another day of training. However, Riku's demeanor hinted at something different. With a subtle nod, Riku signaled for everyone to gather around. The Genins promptly did so, their eyes reflecting a mix of curiosity and excitement. Riku cleared his throat before addressing the team. Good morning, Team 15. Today, we won't have our usual training session. Riku began, I wanted to let you all know that every Jounin leading a Genin team has been informed about the upcoming Chunin exams. 
It's that time, right? Good. I've been waiting. Renjiro's gaze sharpened. The news of the upcoming Chunin exams filled the air with excitement, and the genins of Team 15 couldn't hide their eagerness. The prospect of a Chunin promotion was a dream they had all been working towards. Riku continued, this is a significant step in your journey as Shinobi. The Chunin exams are a chance for you to showcase your skills, face new challenges, and prove your readiness for the next rank. It's an opportunity to measure your growth and learn from the experiences that lie ahead. Riku observed their reactions with a faint smile before raising a hand to temper their enthusiasm. Hold on. While I'm glad to see your excitement, please let's not get ahead of ourselves, he cautioned. Aiko's expression shifted from excitement to curiosity, her brows furrowing slightly. What do you mean, Riku-sensei? Riku nodded, acknowledging their efforts. You've all shown growth, and I commend you for that. However, becoming a Chunin requires more than just completing missions and showcasing individual skills. It's about working seamlessly as a team, strategic thinking, and demonstrating a level of maturity in handling complex situations. You all know how it takes only one change for a mission to go wrong. Possibly endangering your lives. Aiko exchanged a glance with Ranjiro, and Hiro tilted his head in confusion. Riku continued, the Chunin exams aren't just a test of individual strength. They evaluate your ability to collaborate with your team, make sound decisions under pressure, and adapt to unforeseen challenges. It's not just about reaching a certain skill level, it's about proving you're ready to take on more responsibilities as leaders. Aiko, ever assertive, voiced their shared sentiment. But we can handle that, Rika-sensei. We've been through a lot together, and we trust each other. Riku's gaze softened, appreciating their determination. Trust and teamwork are indeed crucial, but I need to be sure that you can navigate the complexities of the exams successfully. Promoting a team prematurely can lead to challenges down the line. Why is he speaking like that? Did he regret ever approving some genins for the exams before? Renjiro wondered. Renjiro, though disappointed, understood the rationale behind Riku's words. So, what do we need to work on? Then? Riku nodded approvingly. My approval. You will need it to apply for the exams. I need you guys to prove to me that you are qualified to become Chunins or at least partake in the exams. It is as simple as that. I don't like this at all. Renjiro did not know why, but after Riku finished his statement, he got an ominous feeling. Especially, after seeing the glint in Riku's eyes. Riku crossed his arms and addressed his genins, I can see the skepticism on your faces. I know it's hard, but participating in the Chunin exams is no small feat if you want my approval, you'll have to work for it. How do we do that? Renjiro asked. Just defeating me in combat. A three versus one. You all against me. This again. Is he sadistic or does he just love beating us? Renjiro was not the only one think this, both Aiko and Hiro had similar thoughts. It was to the extent that they couldn't hide it by their facial expressions. It's not about defeating me in the traditional sense. It's about showing me that you can apply what you've learned, work together as a team, and face adversity. If you can do that, then you'll have my approval for the Chunin exams. Wow. Simple as that. When our training session fights are 30 to 12. He is close to thrice our number of wins. Renjiro sarcastically thought. Riku, noticing the trepidation in his genin team, decided to alleviate their concerns. He raised a reassuring hand and said, don't worry. I won't go all out. I'll limit myself to the power level expected of a normal chunin. This is about evaluating your skills, not overwhelming you. Aiko sighed, realizing the gravity of the task at hand. All right, Riku-sensei. We'll do our best. Riku smiled, that's the spirit. We'll start in a few minutes. Use the time to strategize and prepare. Remember, it's not about winning or losing, it's about showing me your growth as a team. Riku then reached into his pouch, retrieving a small storage scroll. He unfurled it, retrieving three smooth stones from the storage scroll. They're similar to the ones he used in the first test he gave us. Renjiro remarked upon seeing the similar stones. He could still sense their similarities. These stones will be our markers, Riku explained. Riku, observing the recognition in their eyes, smiled knowingly. Yes, you've used these stones before, but this time, the objective is different. 
Instead of protecting them, you'll have to get all three from me. It's a game of offense and strategy. Use your skills wisely. Renjiro nodded, his mind already processing the tactical implications. Got it, Riku-sensei. As the Genins absorbed the challenge set by Riku, the realization that time was a factor crept in. Riku, with a stern yet encouraging tone, informed them, you have until the next sunrise to complete this objective. It's not just about getting the stones, it's about doing so within a time frame. The Chunin exams demand not just skill but efficiency. Use the time wisely. Immediately after that, Riku gave them time to strategize. After some time, Riku came back holding a coin aloft, ready to signal the commencement of their test. As the coin descended, Riku's voice cut through the silence, the moment the coin hits the ground, we begin. I need to be ready to find him. I am sure he will try to flicker away. Renjiro thought as he activated his Sharingan. The coin dropped, and Renjiro reacted swiftly, his eyes trained on Riku. However, instead of flickering away, Riku executed a substitution jutsu, leaving behind a mere log in his place. Shit. Now it's going to be harder to find him. Hiro remarked, he's fast. Keep your guard up. Aiko, suggested, let's spread out, but stay within sight of each other. We need to coordinate to find him quickly. Why do they always feel the need to separate? Anyway, I need to get the stones, of course, Renjiro was not pleased with the suggestion. But that didn't mean that he didn't mind it. We have to get the stones from him. So the logical thing would be to find him and attack as a team. But Riku would already have expected this. So he would probably dash, just when Renjiro was going to conclude his thought process, Riku appeared. You guys actually separated? You never learn. So let me teach you shinobi skills part 1, Genjutsu. Ah shit. You guys actually separated? You never learn. So let me teach you shinobi skills part 1, Genjutsu. Kokwanjio no Jutsu. In the blink of an eye, Riku's commanding voice echoed, resonating with the churning darkness that quickly enveloped Renjiro. The world around him plunged into an abyss of absolute blackness, robbing him of any visual cues. The technique, known as Kokwanjio no Jutsu, lived up to its name, the Bringer of Darkness. Riku's voice echoed from the shadows, a disembodied presence in the pitch-black realm. In darkness, your sight becomes useless, Renjiro. Let's see how you fare when the world itself conspires against you. What is this? I can't see anything. Renjiro strained his senses, attempting to pierce through the absolute absence of light. Every movement felt like wading through a sea of obsidian, and the oppressive silence heightened his vulnerability. This darkness is different. I can feel it as if it's not just an absence of light, but a tangible presence surrounding me. Without warning, strikes came from seemingly random directions. Riku, concealed within the Stygian void, exploited the sensory deprivation to launch a barrage of attacks. Renjiro, unable to pinpoint the source, resorted to instinctual evasion. His limbs moved defensively, desperately attempting to fend off the unseen onslaught. Riku's voice, now a whisper mingling with the shadows, taunted Renjiro. In this darkness, your perception betrays you. Every move, every strike, becomes a game of chance. The onslaught continued, each blow infused with the disorienting dance of shadows. I can't continue like this. I need to find a way to dispel this. But wait. I could try that. Renjiro's Sharingan flickered, attempting to discern the patterns within the inky blackness. His heightened senses strained against the oppressive nature of the Genjutsu. Renjiro, amidst the shroud of darkness, focused his chakra with a newfound determination. His Sharingan glowed fiercely, its crimson hue cutting through the obsidian void. Drawing from the knowledge imparted by Miwa, he invoked the technique, Megan, Kayaten Chiten, the demonic illusion, mirror heaven and earth change. As he weaved the intricate hand seals, the oppressive darkness seemed to waver. Within the illusory dance, a reflective surface emerged, mirroring the surroundings. Renjiro, now the orchestrator of a new Jinjutsu, sought to invert the technique Riku had cast upon him. Impressive. Attempting to unravel the threads of my Jinjutsu. This should be the Jinjutsu that Fugaku developed back then. It is such a nuisance. But let's see if he can succeed. Renjiro, undeterred, gazed into the mirrored expanse, willing the reversal of the darkness. The reflective surface began to ripple, distorting the boundaries between the Jinjutsu and reality. 
Yet, Riku's chakra influence lingered, a subtle resistance challenging Renjiro's grasp on the chakra threads. Why is it hard? The darkness recoiled, and for a fleeting moment, it seemed as if Renjiro had seized control. Yet, Riku's mastery over Genjutsu proved formidable, a puzzle that defied simple unraveling. Riku's laughter resonated, a melodic undercurrent in the churning currents of illusion. You're close, Renjiro. Frustration crept in, but Renjiro clung to the tenets of perseverance. In a surge of willpower, he poured more chakra into the weaving of the counter Genjutsu. As the chakra intensified, a seismic shift occurred within the mirrored expanse. The darkness that once seemed far from Renjiro's influence now quivered under the might of his chakra. Riku, observing the unexpected turn of events, raised an eyebrow in genuine surprise. Well, well. Seems like you've managed it. Impressive, Renjiro. Acknowledging Renjiro's breakthrough, Riku dispelled the Kokwanjio no Jutsu. The oppressive darkness lifted, and the training ground returned to its usual dimly lit state. But you still have to face me Renjiro, Riku said as he moved towards Renjiro not even giving him a breather. Reacting to that, Renjiro used the Shadow Clone Jutsu making 10 Shadow Clones appear. Together, they all surged towards their opponent. Riku, maintaining a calm composure, met their advance with his precise taijutsu skill, instantly dismantling two of the clones with swift and calculated strikes. However, Renjiro had devised a cunning strategy. The remaining clones, witnessing the swift elimination of their counterparts, adapted their tactics. Instead of engaging in direct combat, they dispersed, each clone converging from a different angle, their movements coordinated with a silent precision. Renjiro muttered to himself, let's see how you handle this, Riku-sensei. As the clones drew nearer, their forms pulsated with a volatile chakra. Riku, momentarily caught off guard by the clones' change in approach, realized the imminent danger too late. In a synchronized detonation, the clones erupted in a cascade of explosive force, a technique Renjiro had recently acquired, the Shadow Clone Explosion. The explosion sent shockwaves through the training ground, leaving a haze of smoke in its wake. Amidst the veil of debris, Riku emerged, unscathed but visibly impressed. Well played, Renjiro. Renjiro's chest heaved with exertion. The explosive display not only showcased his adaptability but also hinted at the expanding repertoire of skills he had been cultivating. Gathering himself, Riku analyzed the aftermath. It was in this moment of tense stillness that Renjiro observed Riku with anticipation, awaiting the next move. Riku took a deep breath. The air around him seemed to respond as he exhaled, releasing great shockwaves of water. A torrential force surged outward, obliterating all the shadow clones left as not all of them had exploded. The water, manipulated by Riku's chakra, cascaded in rhythmic waves, dismantling the remnants of Renjiro's strategy. Elsewhere in Training Ground 51, a trio of figures moved with purpose through the grounds. As they navigated the terrain, one of them couldn't help but voice his query. Are you sure this is where Riku is? Another figure replied confidently, yes. I can sense him. Riku just dispelled my shadow clones. The plan is still on track. The minute Riku gave them time to strategize the first thing they did was to agree that they have to work as a team. They then devised a plan to create shadow clones on the training grounds. It was quite obvious that Riku would take the initiative to attack them. Also, his stealth skills were in a league of their own as compared to their so instead of looking for him, they planned to use their shadow clones as bait to lure him. And it worked perfectly, the only issue was that Riku had figured out while fighting Renjiro that it was nothing more than a shadow clone. So he was expecting them. However, they did not care about this as the main objective of the clones was to pinpoint Riku's position. Riku turned to face them, a smirk playing on his lips. Took you long enough. I was wondering when you'd show up. Hiro, with a confident grin, added, you weren't the only one with a plan, sensei. Riku chuckled, appreciating their teamwork. All right then, let's see if your plan can handle the real deal. Hiro immediately took the initiative and used the shuriken clone jutsu. As the jutsu unfolded with precision, a barrage of shurikens hurtled toward Riku. The Jounin swiftly dodged and weaved between them, showcasing his impressive agility. As Riku avoided the shurikens, the genin seized the opportunity, and with a flicker, they appeared in front of Riku. The swift transition caught Riku off guard, 
and the fight branched off into a rapid taijutsu assault. Hiro Saber clashed with Riku's swift taijutsu moves, and Renjiro, recognizing the need to go all out, activated his Sharingan. Aiko, on the other hand, attempted to use Jinjutsu, but it proved ineffective against Riku's experienced defenses. The intense fight reached a momentary stalemate when Riku, with a smirk, declared, Shinobi skills 3, Ninjutsu. However, before he could unleash any Jutsu, his observant gaze caught the flickering movements of his genins a distance away. His eyes widened when his gaze moved into their hands. They were all holding the stones in their hands. Riku's gaze moved over to his pouch where he was sure the stones were only to find it empty. Riku's eyes widened when his gaze moved into his genin's hands. They were all holding the stones in their hands. Riku's gaze moved over to his pouch, where he was sure the stones were, only to find it empty. When did they get it? The surprise etched across Riku's face was palpable, his eyes narrowing as he surveyed the empty pouch. The element of surprise had been masterfully executed, catching even the seasoned Jounin off guard. Aiko couldn't help but smirk. It seems, Sensei, that we've managed to learn a thing or two from your previous tests. Rinjiro added, you taught us to expect the unexpected. It's only fair that we turn the tables every once in a while. Riku, recovering from his initial surprise, couldn't help but crack a smile. Well played, guys. You've earned my approval for the Chunin exams. It seemed that Riku had finally caught on to what his genins had done to retrieve the three stones from him. Of course, he had earlier told them where the stones would be, to make things easier for them. Their only challenge was how to get them from him. Back when the challenge was set by Riku, the members of Team 15 had begun brainstorming strategies to outsmart their Jounin sensei. Hiro proposed, why don't we just go for a frontal assault? We can overwhelm him with our combined strength. Aiko shook her head. Hiro, even if sensei holds back, there's no way we can defeat him in a direct confrontation, we already tried that during our training and it didn't end well. We need a plan that plays to our strengths. Renjiro chimed in, what if we use Jinjutsu? We could confuse him and make our move. Aiko raised an eyebrow, Riku is no slouch when it comes to Jinjutsu. He'd see through it immediately, Renjiro. Renjiro nodded, acknowledging the point. True, but what if we use a layered approach? Create a Jinjutsu that's a distraction while we execute our real plan. Hiro scratched his head, intrigued but unsure. How do we even make him fall for the distraction? He's more experienced than us when it comes to such things. Renjiro offered a sly smile. That's where the beauty lies. We'll make it so convincing that he won't suspect it's a setup. Renjiro, sensing the doubts lingering in the minds of his teammates, added. Look, guys, Riku might know about our abilities, but he has no idea about my Jinjutsu practice. He's aware of our strengths, but he won't see this coming. I am not quite a master at it, but I can give it a try. Hiro crossed his arms, but won't he expect us to use Jinjutsu? I mean, it's a bit too obvious, isn't it? Renjiro grinned, his Sharingan reflecting a glint of mischief. That's precisely the point. Riku will be ready for Jinjutsu, but not from me. He'll be expecting it from Aiko. We'll use that expectation to our advantage. Aiko, catching on to Renjiro's plan, nodded in agreement. He's right. Riku knows my expertise lies in Jinjutsu. If we catch him off guard with Renjiro's skills, it might just work. Hiro, though still uncertain, shrugged and conceded, all right, let's give it a shot. All right, so Aiko will initiate her Jinjutsu as a distraction. Then, when Riku is focused on countering her Jinjutsu, I will slip in with my own. It has to be subtle and something he won't notice immediately. Aiko nodded. Got it. I'll make it not too obvious, so he won't even realize it's happening until it's too late. As the team finalized their plan, Hiro raised an eyebrow. So, what's our plan B? Because this seems a bit too risky, and I wasn't even aware Renjiro was practicing Jinjutsu. Renjiro glanced at Hiro, his expression serious. We don't have a plan B. This is it, do or die. If we fail to pull this off, we're not participating in the Chunin exams. The stakes are high, Hiro. Hiro let out a sigh, realizing the gravity of the situation. Well, I guess we're all in then. With the plan set, they dispersed to their positions, each mentally preparing for the challenge that lay ahead. Meanwhile, Renjiro focused on the details of his Jinjutsu, 
aiming for a level of finesse that would catch even a seasoned Jounin off guard. Which Jinjutsu should I use? It can't be too flashy, otherwise our plan will fall like a house of cards. Right. I can use that. Fortunately for them, their plan worked like clockwork. The element of surprise helped Renjiro slip into his Jinjutsu dulling Riku's senses and securing the three stones from him. The Jinjutsu Renjiro used was the very first one he learned, the demonic illusion, false surroundings technique. It was the one Aiko had used on him. Renjiro did not go all out with it as he had to ensure Riku didn't get wind of it. Back to the present, Riku, who had been impressed by their ingenuity, approached them with a proud smile. You've earned my approval for the Chunin exams. Take this opportunity seriously and take care of yourselves during the exams. Right now, the village needs every capable ninja it can get, and your promotion will be a significant contribution. Riku continued, remember, being a Chunin comes with more responsibilities. Train hard and make the village proud. Good luck in the exams, and make the most out of this chance. With those words of encouragement, Riku left them to contemplate the journey ahead. Since it was well into the evening they decided to meet up the next day to apply for the Chunin exams. The sun had just begun to cast its morning glow over the village as Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro approached the Hokage building. The air was thick with anticipation, and the trio couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and nervousness as they prepared to officially apply for the Chunin exams. As they arrived at the registration building for the Chunin exams, they were met with a bustling scene. The place was filled with genins from various teams. As they navigated through the sea of genins outside the registration building, Renjiro couldn't help but express his surprise. Has it always been this crowded during the Chunin exams? Hiro glanced around, not really. This time, they've opened up the opportunity for genin reserves to take part. That's why there's such a surge in participants. The trio strolled among the genins, weaving through the lively crowd. The registration desk was a hive of activity. A Chunin official sat behind it, sorting through stacks of paperwork and calling out names. The trio approached the desk, and the Chunin looked up with a friendly yet efficient demeanor. Team 15, I presume, she said, glancing at her clipboard. Renjiro nodded. That's right. We're here to register for the Chunin exams. The Chunin quickly located their team on the list. Perfect. Fill out these forms, and once you're done, bring them back to me. As they took the forms, Renjiro couldn't help but overhear snippets of conversations from the other genins. Hey, did you hear Team 10 is participating? I hope we get a chance to face off against Team 7. They're always making headlines. Think they'll have us do the Forest of Death again? Renjiro couldn't help but glance around, expecting to see unfamiliar faces from other villages. However, his expectations were met with a hint of disappointment. Why is everyone from Konoha? Renjiro wondered, are there no participants from other villages this time? Renjiro inquired, Aiko shook her head. No, this time, it's an internal affair. The Chunin exams will only feature Konoha's own shinobis. And here I was expecting genins from other villages. But with the temporary peace, it would be hard to do so. Renjiro exchanged glances with Aiko and Hiro, a bit surprised but nonetheless understanding the reasoning behind the decision. Perhaps it was a strategic move, focusing on strengthening the village's internal capabilities before engaging in external competitions. Completing the paperwork, Renjiro handed the forms back to the receptionist. Thank you, he said, his tone a mix of determination and readiness. We're looking forward to the exams. After registering for the Chunin exams, Renjiro returned home to make final preparations. He took a moment to review his theories on Jinjutsu and pondered how he could incorporate them into his performance during the exams. Sitting at his desk, he meticulously inspected his ninja tools, making sure each kunai and shuriken was in perfect condition. Alone in his room, Renjiro reflected on his journey from a determined genin to a participant in the Chunin exams. As he laid out his ninja headband and carefully adjusted his gear, he whispered to himself, This is it, Renjiro. The sun had just begun to cast its warm glow over the village as Renjiro joined Aiko and Hiro on the journey to the Chunin exam center. The atmosphere buzzed with anticipation, and Renjiro couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and nervousness. Hiro, eager and confident, led the way with determined strides. As they walked, Renjiro engaged in casual conversation with Aiko, 
discussing various topics to lighten the mood before the exams. Well, it was more to lighten his mood. However, amidst their banter, Renjiro picked up on something unusual. Renjiro began to notice a deviation from the expected path. The familiar surroundings of the village started to give way to the dense trees of the infamous Forest of Death. Where are we headed to? Renjiro narrowed his eyes, as he turned to Hiro. Hiro, this isn't the way to the exam center. Why are we heading to the Forest of Death? Hiro's expression remained stoic, what do you mean exam center? The exam is in the Forest of Death. Wait, wasn't there usually a written test before the Forest of Death part? Renjiro's confusion deepened as Hiro seemed genuinely unaware of what he was talking about. Are you okay Renjiro? I thought you were aware that the first phase of the exams began at the Forest of Death. She was concerned as today they all had to put on their a game for their exams. If Renjiro was not at his best, then it could also affect them negatively during the exams. Right, I'm technically in the past of the anime, so it would make sense if the Chunin exams format of this year would be different than the one from Naruto's time. Well, there aren't any other villages participating, so that should have informed me already of the changes. Ah? I had forgotten about it, sorry, Renjiro sheepishly replied. Okay, as long as you are fine, Aiko replied. The crowd I am sensing are probably other genins congregating in the forest. Renjiro surmised as they drew closer to the forest. The group quickly arrived at their destination and stood in a corner on their own. They did not see the need to socialize with others out of nerves, they stood there, patiently waiting for the arrival of the other genins and exam instructors. After a brief wait, five shinobi suddenly emerged, their presence marked by the rustling of leaves. Renjiro narrowed his eyes, recognizing the distinct features of the approaching group. Aiko whispered to the team, here they come. Stay sharp, everyone. Gather around. One of the shinobi shouted. He was Shimura Taki. Taki Shimura, the appointed Jounin proctor for the first phase of the Chunin exams, emerged as a commanding presence. He stood tall, his muscular frame reflecting the physical prowess expected of a seasoned ninja. His spiky, dark hair framed a stern face that bore the marks of countless battles, giving him an air of experienced authority. Dressed in the traditional Kanoha flak jacket, Taki's demeanor exuded a sense of confidence and no-nonsense professionalism. His sharp, onyx eyes surveyed the gathered genins, assessing them with a keen and observant gaze. A Kanoha headband adorned with the village symbol was securely fastened around his forehead, emphasizing his allegiance to the leaf. As he stepped forward, Taki's voice carried a firm and authoritative tone. Greetings, aspiring shinobi. I am Taki Shimura, a jounin here in Kanoha and your proctor for this phase of the Chunin exams. Pay close attention to the rules, and remember, only those who adapt and persevere will proceed to the next stage. His words, delivered with a weight that spoke of experience, resonated within the clearing. Taki continued, beginning the process of outlining the challenges that awaited the candidates in the Forest of Death. As Taki Shimura outlined the details of the Chunin exam's first phase, the tension among the Genin grew palpable. In this phase, each team will be given one of two scrolls, the Heaven Scroll or the Earth Scroll. Your objective is to safeguard your team scroll while attempting to steal the opposing team scroll. However, the catch is that to pass, your team must possess both scrolls by the time you reach the finish line. The forest is vast, and the challenges are many. Use your wits and teamwork wisely. He paused, surveying the sea of determined faces before him. Remember, not all encounters will be hostile. Some teams might be willing to cooperate, while others will see you as competition. Adaptability is key. And keep in mind that not all threats will come from fellow genins, the forest itself harbors dangers. Exercise caution, trust your teammates, and do whatever it takes to ensure both scrolls are in your possession when you reach the finish line, Taki emphasized. You have one week to navigate through the forest of death and secure both scrolls, Taki explained, his voice cutting through the air. During this time, you may encounter other genin teams. Engaging in battles is allowed, but remember, this is not a fight to the death. Killing is strictly prohibited. We don't want to lose valuable shinobi over a competition. Use your ninja skills wisely, and may the best teams succeed. The gravity of the situation sank in as genin teams exchanged glances, sizing up potential allies or threats. 
The vastness of the forest and the multitude of challenges it held became more apparent as they prepared to step into the unknown. Taki's final words resonated, survival is not just about defeating others, it's about overcoming the obstacles within the forest. Make alliances if needed, but remember, only those with both scrolls at the finish line will proceed to the next phase. Best of luck, and may your teamwork shine. He glanced at the array of eager genin. Now, the scrolls will be distributed randomly, so make your way to the designated starting point and await further instructions. As the Genin teams lined up to receive their scrolls, the atmosphere was charged with anticipation. Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro stood together, waiting for their turn. Taki Shimura and the other instructors observed the teams, ready to hand out the scrolls. Taki handed Team 15 with the Earth Scroll. Here is your scroll. Your objective is to acquire the Heaven Scroll. Remember, both scrolls must be in your possession when you reach the finish line. Rinjiro nodded, firmly holding the Earth Scroll in his hands. Not long after every team had their scroll and the exam was about to begin. With a command from Taki, they all headed to their designated starting points of the Forest of Death. Rinjiro's strategic mind kicked in as they entered the daunting Forest of Death. The team had decided to take a direct route to the finish point, bypassing potential confrontations in the heart of the forest. I am sure there will be teams waiting at the end to ambush us for our scrolls. It will be better to just go ahead and do the same to them. Rinjiro led the way, we're going straight for the finish line. No unnecessary risks. I don't want to give other teams a chance to ambush us for our scrolls, he declared, glancing back at Aiko and Hiro. Hiro, his senses alert, added, yeah, let's not waste time dealing with others. We've got a week, but I'd rather be out of this forest as soon as possible. As Team 15 ventured deeper into the forest of death, their progress was unexpectedly halted when they encountered three other Genin teams standing in their path. The coincidence was uncanny, all three teams seemed to have the same goal in mind, acquiring an earth scroll. Give us your scroll, demanded one of the male Genin, flanked by a neem dog that growled menacingly. A quick observation suggested that he was likely from the Inazuka clan. Renjiro, maintaining his calm demeanor, responded with a raised eyebrow, How sure are you that we have the scroll you're looking for? We might as well have the same scrolls as you. The tension in the air thickened as the genins from both teams exchanged wary glances. Renjiro furrowed his brow, realizing that the situation had escalated quicker than he anticipated. Don't worry about that, we already know she has it, another girl, sporting the Byakugan, said while pointing directly at Aiko. Aiko sighed. In hindsight, Renjiro lamented not putting the scroll in a storage seal. It would have been a strategic move to avoid unnecessary confrontations like the one unfolding before them. Recognizing the increasing hostility, Renjiro turned to his teammates with a subtle nod, a silent signal understood by Aiko and Hiro. The trio moved in a synchronized manner, creating some distance between them and the opposing teams. Renjiro, confident in his abilities, decided to take the initiative. Performing the necessary hand sign, Renjiro unleashed his favorite technique, the fire release, great fireball jutsu. He anticipated the element of surprise, hoping to deter any potential attackers. However, to his shock, a girl from the opposing group swiftly jumped in front of him, mirroring his jutsu with equal mastery. Not so quick, Renjiro Kuen, the girl countered with a smirk, effortlessly evading the impact of the two fireball jutsus. The air crackled with the intensity of dual fireballs, creating a brief moment of tension as the fiery orbs faced off. Renjiro, maintaining his composure, locked eyes with the girl who mirrored his jutsu. Well, this is unexpected, he muttered. It seemed the encounter in the forest of death was about to take a more intriguing turn. The girl's attire accentuated both practicality and agility, a short-sleeved gray dress with slits on either side for enhanced mobility, secured by a black belt. Her long black hair, adorned with bangs, framed her determined expression. As Renjiro observed the Sharingan within the girl's eyes, a realization struck him. I should have known why she looked familiar, he thought to himself. Good thing it is only one Tomo, otherwise this would have been a hassle. Renjiro considered himself fortunate. While he wasn't about to underestimate her abilities, this detail provided a potential advantage. The other genins from both teams did not stand idly as they all moved towards Hiro and Aiko. 
Rinjiro spoke as he retrieved his boa from a storage scroll. It should only be fair to know your name since you already know mine. With a nod, Amari introduced herself, I am Achiha Amari. Nice to finally meet you. As she uttered those words, two shadow clones materialized by her side, each moving directly towards Aiko and Hiro. It was quite clear that they were heading to reinforce her fellow genins when fighting against Hiro and Aiko. Two can play that game. Rinjiro thought as he made three shadow clones. One to intercept Amari's shadow clones and two to help his teammates. Amari already knew that it would be an uphill battle for her since Renjiro's Sharingan was far better than hers as it had two extra tomos. She wanted her fellow genins to quickly knock out Hiro and Aiko so that they could all take on Renjiro. Without much talking, they both moved towards each other and the clash transitioned into a taijutsu fight. Renjiro's proficiency with the Bois granted him an initial advantage in the duel against Amari. As Renjiro unleashed a flurry of strikes, Amari swiftly dodged and parried, demonstrating her agility and the precognitive abilities granted by her Sharingan. Despite Renjiro's onslaught, Amari's movement seemed almost prescient, enabling her to evade the majority of the blows. As the combatants weaved through the dense foliage, Renjiro's clone engaged Amari's shadow clones, each movement calculated and precise. You're skilled, Amari, but let's see how you handle this, he exclaimed as his Sharingan glowed momentarily as he unleashed his Sharingan's Jinjutsu, hoping to gain more advantage in the physical exchange. Amari, however, was quick to react. She adeptly disrupted her chakra flow, countering the Jinjutsu. In a bid to turn the tide, Amari swiftly performed a set of hand signs, her Sharingan glowing intensely as she executed the windmill triple blade technique. Three windmill shuriken spun in the air, their blades glinting dangerously as they sailed toward Renjiro. The wires attached to the shuriken trailed behind, controlled expertly by Amari. Renjiro's keen perception allowed him to anticipate the incoming threat, but the precision of Amari's technique made it challenging to evade entirely. As the shuriken approached, Renjiro and his clones dodged and weaved, trying to outmaneuver the deadly projectiles. However, Amari's mastery of the technique became apparent as she manipulated the wires with finesse. The spinning blades began to encircle Renjiro, creating a deadly dance of sharp edges. The wires tightened, and with a swift, controlled motion, Amari skillfully bound Renjiro, containing him. Impressive move, Amari. But how long can you keep up? Your chakra is already waning. As the windmill shuriken returned to her hand, Amari found herself ensnared in Renjiro's cunning strategy. The disruptive nature of her chakra because of countering the Jinjutsu, combined with the pressure of the ongoing Taijutsu engagement, made it increasingly challenging for her to maintain her focus. She eventually fell into Renjiro's Jinjutsu. Amari struggled against the Jinjutsu, her Sharingan attempting to pierce through the deceptive technique. However, Renjiro's skill in Jinjutsu proved formidable, and despite her efforts, Amari succumbed to the mental assault. As the Jinjutsu took effect, Amari's movements faltered, and her eyes lost as she lost consciousness. Renjiro observed the outcome, surprised at how swiftly the confrontation had concluded. Well, that was easier than I expected but I should have settled this sooner, he remarked. Amari should have been a genin for far longer than he was, so he expected more from her. Renjiro quickly approached Amari's unconscious form and placed a seal on her forehead, his chakra drain seal. It was a precautionary measure to suppress any potential threat should she regain consciousness ahead of schedule. Satisfied with his preparations, he turned his attention back to Aiko and Hiro. Surprisingly, Hiro had managed to deal with his opponents efficiently. Aiko, on the other hand, had effectively ensnared a group of genins in a genjutsu, preventing them from interfering. The other genins they fought had nothing special other than the fact that besides the Hyuga girl and the Inazuka boy, there was a Sarutobi and Shimura boy and a Senju girl among them. Rinjiro took a moment to assess the situation, great job, both of you. Looks like we won't have much trouble collecting the scrolls we need, together, they began searching through the possessions of the unconscious genins. After a brief but thorough search, they discovered three heaven scrolls. Two were neatly stored in storage scrolls, while the third was clutched by the Inazuka boy who had initially confronted them. Renjiro eyed the scrolls they had gathered, what do you think, should we take all of them, he suggested. 
Rinjiro was petty enough to take all the scrolls as he thought that it was only fair to prepare to lose your scroll if you were ready to steal scrolls belonging to others. However, both Hiro and Aiko seemed to disagree. Hiro shook his head, that might be pushing it. Let's not stoop to their level. We'll take the one we found on the Inazuka and leave the rest. Aiko nodded in agreement, I think Hiro's right. We can't control what others do, but we can choose our own path. Taking all the scrolls would be too much. Rinjiro sighed, fine, let's do it your way. We'll stick to the one scroll we found, he conceded. As the team departed from the encounter with the other genin groups, Renjiro meticulously removed the chakra drain seals he had placed on the unconscious foes. With the seals taken care of, the genin trio hastened their pace towards the finish line of the Forest of Death. The finish point of the first phase of the Chunin exams was a towering structure in the middle of the Forest of Death. Tall trees surrounded the tower, their branches creating a natural fortress that concealed its entry points. The tower was not just a structure but also a testament to the village's history. Originally, it served as the Hokage's building when the Hidden Leaf was founded. The stones that composed its sturdy walls had witnessed the village's growth, evolution, and the rise of its legendary shinobis. Surrounding the tower was the forest which was the handiwork of the first Hokage, Senju Hashirama. The great leader and founder of Kanoha had crafted this forest with his unparalleled wood release. The creation of the forest was deeply linked to an attempt on the first Hokage's life. It was recorded that an assassin, dispatched from the distant village hidden in the waterfalls, Takigakir, had targeted Hashirama. Remarkably, this would-be assassin stood alone as the only individual to survive an attempt on Hashirama's life. In the aftermath of the attempted assassination, Kanoha recognized the strategic value of this now forested expanse. The village intentionally cultivated the area, turning it into a breeding ground for various beasts. These creatures served as an additional layer of security, enhancing the natural deterrent provided by the dense foliage. Following the demise of the first and second Hokages, the Hokage's office underwent a significant relocation. It moved from the tower to a more central location within the village. This strategic shift aimed to enhance administrative efficiency and accessibility, placing the seat of the village leader closer to the heart of Kanoha. The vacated tower found a new purpose. It became the residence of the Jinchuriki, beginning with Senju Mito. Over the years, the tower continued to serve as the dwelling place of the Jinchuriki as Uzumaki Kushina, the current Jinchuriki also resided within its walls. However, a pivotal incident altered the tower's fate once again. The kidnapping of Uzumaki Kushina prompted the village to reconsider its use. Clearly, it was no longer safe to house any of the village's assets. In the aftermath, the tower was reassigned, finding a new role as a venue for the Chunin exams. The Forest of Death now played host to a different kind of challenge, the proving ground for the next generation of shinobi during the Chunin exams. With it as the finish point, the Genins had to enter the Forest of Death through the numerous entrances scattered in the forest. This was to ensure they didn't run into each other immediately after the exam started. The case between Team 15 and the three Genin teams was just an exception. A mere stroke of luck, or lack of it, for the Genin teams. Inside the tower, the atmosphere buzzed with tension as dawn painted the sky. A group of seasoned shinobis, responsible for monitoring the ongoing Chunin exams, gathered to assess the progress of the participating genins. At the forefront of this operation was Shimura Taki, the appointed exam proctor, whose experienced gaze scrutinized the unfolding events. As the third day of the Chunin exams dawned, Taki leaned forward, his focus intense. He turned to a fellow shinobi holding a clipboard and requested a detailed rundown of the current status. The shinobi scanned the gathered information, eyes moving swiftly across the entries. After a moment, she raised her eyes to meet Taki's gaze. Proctor Taki, as of now, only one team has successfully arrived at the tower. The others are still locked in battles for the scrolls. Within two days? That must be a new record. Taki wondered. The shinobi holding the clipboard reported to Taki with information relayed by the sensor unit deployed within the Forest of Death. The periodic updates provided crucial insights into the Genin's progress and the unfolding dynamics of the Chunin exams. Keep a close eye on them. If there are any changes in their status or movements, notify me immediately. 
We need to stay informed about all teams during this critical phase of the exams, he instructed. With that, the sensor unit continued to monitor the situation at Forest of Death. Back at the Forest of Death, Team 15 had been venturing through the dense and treacherous landscape of the forest. Having covered a substantial distance from their initial entry point, the team found themselves drawing nearer to the tower. As the Genins continued their trek through the Forest of Death, luck seemed to be on their side as they managed to avoid encountering other Genin teams. The dense foliage served as a great backdrop and concealed them from potential adversaries, allowing the team to navigate the terrain without unnecessary conflicts. However, surviving in the forest presented its own set of challenges. The team had packed rations to sustain them, but they didn't pack enough. A rookie mistake. The team members had to rely on their training and instincts to discern edible plants from potentially harmful ones, to supplement their sustenance during this phase of the Chunin exams. Moreover, the wilderness also posed a formidable environment. All in all, they were in a race against time for their survival. As Renjiro rose from his makeshift bed of leaves and twigs, the soft murmur of the forest greeted him. The rustling leaves and distant calls of unseen creatures blended into a symphony that underscored the serenity of the early morning. Morning, Renjiro, Hiro yawned, stretching his arms wide, the lingering traces of sleep still evident in his voice. Aiko, nearby, sat up and rubbed her eyes, a faint smile forming on her lips. Good morning, we should get ready to head out. Renjiro, still shaking off the last remnants of sleep, managed a half-smile. Little did they know, the tranquility of the early morning would soon give way to a cascade of unforeseen events, setting the stage for a day that would test their mettle in ways they couldn't yet fathom. Renjiro, feeling the need to relieve himself, ventured to a nearby spot for privacy as he answered nature calls. As he went about his business, the soothing sounds of nature surrounded him. However, his tranquil moment was abruptly interrupted by Hiro's sudden approach. Hiro! What's the hurry? Renjiro called out, a mix of curiosity and concern in his voice. Hiro, with a sense of urgency, zoomed towards Renjiro, his expression that of fear. It was evident that something significant had transpired. Renjiro! Just run! Hiro exclaimed. The anticipation hung in the air as Renjiro, still in the process of washing his face, looked at Hiro with a raised eyebrow, ready to hear the revelation. Renjiro was confused, mostly due to the fact that he still had the lingering after-effects of sleep, what the hell is happening? Soon, Aiko trailed a few meters behind Hiro. The atmosphere, initially filled with the tranquility of the forest, now brimmed with tension and urgency. Aiko, what's the hurry? Renjiro asked again, his confusion growing. Before Hiro could respond, Renjiro's eyes widened as he saw the cause of their hastened retreat, a horde of giant spiders emerging from the shadows of the forest. The arachnids, with their menacing size, skittered rapidly, their movements creating an unsettling rustle in the underbrush. Giant spiders. Move, Renjiro. Hiro shouted with a sense of urgency in his voice. Reacting swiftly to the imminent danger, Renjiro joined Hiro and Aiko in their mad dash through the forest of death. The trio weaved through the trees, maneuvering around roots and bushes as they sought refuge from the relentless pursuit of the giant spiders. You have to be kidding me, Renjiro thought. Spiders? You've got to be kidding me, Renjiro muttered, his tone a mix of disbelief and dread. Ever since he came into existence for the very first time, Renjiro came to fear and hate certain things in life. The three things were death, taxes and spiders. He had strong emotions when it came to these three things. Death, because of obvious reasons, taxes was because he did not subscribe to the school of thought regarding collective civic responsibility. Spiders, however, bugged him for as long as he could remember. After being reincarnated into this world, Renjiro adopted a new life with a different set of challenges than his previous one. He had come to overcome his fear of taxes since Kanoha was not asking for much from his earnings, and death since he had already experienced it. Unfortunately, he still feared spiders. It was as if this trait was etched into his very core. His arachnophobia was not just a mere discomfort, but a full-blown phobia that sent shivers down his spine. The fear was so intense that the mere sight of spiders triggered a cascade of emotions, ranging from anxiety to panic, leaving him dreaded. This phobia could be traced back to his experiences in his previous life. 
Whether it was an incident from his childhood, a traumatic encounter with a particularly venomous spider, or simply an irrational fear that developed over time, the exact origin remained buried in his subconscious. The fear, however, was undeniably real. Leaving flight was his only option when he saw the giant spiders on their heels. The five colossal spiders in question bore a nightmarish semblance to the ordinary spiders Renjiro knew from his past life. Their hairy legs, thick exoskeletons, and multiple eyes glowed eerily in the dappled light filtering through the dense canopy. The spiders moved with an uncanny synchronicity, their predatory instincts heightened by an earthy aura that cloaked their monstrous forms. Earth release jutsus manifested as rocky protrusions covering their exoskeletons, providing an additional layer of armor to these already formidable creatures. As they closed in, the forest floor quivered beneath the weight of their massive bodies. Each spider's legs, adorned with jagged rocks and sharp edges, served as both a means of mobility and lethal weaponry. Their eyes, multiple and unblinking, gleamed with otherworldly intelligence. Is this really worth it? His phobia was getting the better of him as he even considered leaving the test. That was how bad it was for him. However, just as quick as the thought came, Renjiro quickly shut it down. Surprisingly, their journey for the last two days had been devoid of the usual perils one might expect in a place with such a foreboding name and for a moment, they almost forgot about the notorious beasts that often lurked in the forest were also a threat as opposed to their fellow genins. As they continued their frenzied escape, Hero's voice cut through the chaotic environment. Guys, I think we've lost their trail. The words prompted Renjiro, Aiko, and Hiro to a stop. Breathing heavily, Renjiro looked around, his eyes darting nervously in search of any sign of the gigantic arachnids. The forest, however, seemed devoid of the relentless pursuit that had haunted them moments ago. Most predators are territorial, so maybe we might have gone beyond their territory. Renjiro thought as he took a deep breath, attempting to steady his nerves. Hiro scanned the surroundings before remarking, we might have flickered a bit too far away from our intended path, but at least we got away with the scrolls. That's a silver lining, I guess. Aiko suddenly went pale. Her eyes widened in realization, and she blurted out, guys, the scrolls. I forgot to get them when the spiders started chasing us. Hiro's expression turned from relief to disbelief, and Renjiro couldn't hide his frustration. Aiko's revelation sparked an immediate argument among them. Renjiro exclaimed, what? Are you serious, Aiko? Those scrolls are our ticket out of this forest. Aiko, feeling the weight of her mistake, defended herself, I didn't mean to forget them. It's just that with those spiders chasing us, my mind was focused on getting away. I thought we had them with us. Hiro interjected, trying to defuse the tension, all right, let's not waste time arguing. We need to go back and retrieve the scrolls. Every second we spend here puts us at risk. I knew we should have gotten all the scrolls from those three genin teams. Renjiro suggested an alternative plan for obvious reasons. Guys, instead of going back for our scrolls, why don't we find other teams and take their scrolls? It's more efficient, and we won't risk encountering those spiders again. Aiko retorted, we can't just abandon our scrolls. Hiro found himself torn between the two options. Renjiro has a point, but we can't ignore our scrolls either. What if we can't find another team with either scroll? After a brief but intense discussion, Renjiro found himself outvoted. The team decided to head back to their makeshift resting place to retrieve the scrolls. I just hope that the spiders are no longer there. Renjiro hoped as they headed back but deep down, he knew it was just a pipe dream for him. Unfortunately for Renjiro, the spiders were indeed at their former resting place. They had no choice but to engage them in combat while looking for their scrolls, fuck this shit. As the spiders attacked them with earth jutsus, Renjiro unleashed a barrage of fire release techniques to counter their defenses. Flames danced through the air, clashing with the spiders' earth-based attacks. Aiko, recognizing an opportunity, joined the assault. Renjiro, focused on the battle, shouted instructions to his teammates. Aiko, aim for their legs with your wind jutsus. Hiro, look for the scrolls. They have earth chakra nature, so counting their earth jutsu will be tricky. Hiro should take point on this. Since the spiders had earth chakra affinity, they switched up their strategy with Hiro and Aiko fighting against them while Renjiro had to look for the scrolls. 
Between Aiko and Renjiro, Aiko was better at lightning release as Renjiro's experience wasn't so high. The shift in strategy unfolded seamlessly as Renjiro took on the responsibility of locating the scrolls while Hiro and Aiko adjusted their tactics to engage the arachnids effectively. Renjiro meanwhile, navigated the battlefield with calculated agility, focusing on locating the scrolls amidst the tumultuous clash. Where did Aiko place the scrolls? Renjiro asked as he retraced their steps to their previous resting place. The once makeshift campsite bore the marks of a brief but intense struggle. As Renjiro approached the clearing where they had set up their temporary camp, he scrutinized every inch of the ground, hoping to catch a glimpse of the concealed scrolls. Not finding them, his Sharingan scanned every inch of the surroundings, seeking any subtle disturbances. Renjiro's mind raced, considering every possibility. Could another team have stumbled upon their camp and taken the scrolls during the chaos of the spider battle? Or had they misplaced the scrolls in their panic? Either Aiko does not know where she placed the scrolls or some other team found the scrolls. Or maybe something else happened because the scrolls aren't here. Renjiro's expression darkened as the reality of their situation settled in. Some team must have gotten lucky and found them, he remarked, a tinge of frustration evident in his voice. Their scrolls had slipped through their fingers, and the thought of another team benefiting from their misfortune added salt to the wound. After not finding the scrolls, Renjiro went back and helped Hiro and Aiko with the spiders and after a drawn-out battle, they finally defeated the five spiders. After informing the rest that he couldn't find the scrolls they all searched the camp gain but the result was still the same. Hiro, his eyes reflecting a mix of disappointment and determination, voiced, what now? We can't just sit around. Aiko suggested, we have no choice but to start hunting for them again. There are other teams out there, and we can't afford to fall behind. Renjiro nodded in agreement, let's stick to the plan. We head close to the tower, but keep an eye out for other genin teams. We'll recover the scrolls one way or another. With renewed resolve, the trio set off once more. As they ventured deeper into the forest, the occasional rustle of leaves or the distant calls of unseen creatures heightened their alertness. The days stretched on the trio, determined to recover the scrolls and make it to the tower, relentlessly pursued other genin teams. However, fortune seemed to elude them, as every encounter ended in disappointment. Hiro voiced his frustration. This is getting us nowhere. How are we supposed to find the scrolls if everyone's in the same boat? Aiko added, we'll have to be patient. There's a lot of ground to cover. Three days had passed in this frustrating cycle of pursuit and disappointment. The lack of scrolls among the remaining genin teams only mirrored their plight. With the deadline quickly approaching, they decided to head closer to the tower to ambush teams planning on doing so to get other scrolls. At least that way they could guarantee one or even two scrolls. As they drew near, they heard the sounds of battle. Clashes of metal and the shouts of people echoed through the forest. The scene that unfolded before them was one chaotic, a large-scale brawl unfolding among numerous genins, each vying for possession of the coveted scrolls. It is like a full-on battle royale for the scrolls. Renjiro said as he viewed what was transpired with his Sharingan. The genins exchanged surprised glances, realizing that their initial plan to ambush a team for scrolls might be more challenging than anticipated. Renjiro voiced, looks like we're not the only ones with this idea. It seems everyone is desperate for scrolls. But it is the sixth day, so it is understandable, Aiko remarked. Hiro cracked his knuckles. Doesn't matter. We'll just have to fight our way through. We need those scrolls, and we're not going home empty-handed. Team 15 advanced toward the tumultuous scene, navigating through the thick vegetation to get a clearer view of the ongoing battle. Gen and teams clashed in a frenzy of jutsus, weapons, and strategic maneuvers. Renjiro, scanning the chaos, we need to find a way to get those scrolls without getting caught in the crossfire. As the genins infiltrated the chaotic battlefield, they moved with a combination of caution and precision. Aiko whispered to Renjiro and Hiro, I've spotted a team with a scroll up ahead. They seem focused on their opponents. Now's our chance. As they neared the targeted team, Renjiro signaled for a quick and silent approach. Hiro, his muscles tensed for action, unsheathed his saber, ready to strike if the need arose. The targeted genin team, engrossed in their battle, remained oblivious to the approaching threat. Renjiro, seizing the opportune moment, moved with swift efficiency. 
In a seamless motion, he reached for the scroll secured on the enemy's belts, expertly removing them. Or so it seemed as the genin noticed this. Using his Sharingan, Renjiro knocked her out before she could notify her teammates. The scroll they got was the Heaven Scroll. Now they just needed the Earth Scroll to pass the test. Since the plan worked seamlessly, they tried it again after spotting a team with the Earth Scroll. Their plan almost worked but the Genin this time tried to give chase but luckily for them, they were held back by the opponents they were fighting. Their opponents did not see Renjiro, so they thought that the Genin was trying to escape. Finally. Besides the whole spiders thing, it was quite easy. Targeting desperate and tired Genins really worked. Renjiro thought as they made their way to the tower. They entered the tower and were greeted by the spacious interior that contrasted with the confines of the forest. The atmosphere was tense, with other Genin teams scattered around, some celebrating their success, while others strategized for the upcoming phases. Renjiro approached the registration desk where Chunin exam official was overseeing the proceedings. We're here to complete the first phase. The Chunin on duty examined the scrolls and nodded, good you're the 30th team to finish the forest of death phase. Well done. You can proceed to the waiting area. As team 15 entered the designated waiting area within the tower, they found themselves in the company of familiar faces. Team 10 and team 13 were among the groups already present. Anze greeted them casually, hey guys. I see you guys finally made it. Renjiro nodded in acknowledgement, yeah, barely. How about you guys? Ono, from team 10, chimed in with a smirk, we finished on the third day. The forest was a bit crowded, but we managed. Hiro, looking at the other teams, added, guess we weren't the only ones facing tough competition. Team 13, how was your experience? Cho spoke, finished on the fourth day. A few close encounters, but nothing we couldn't handle. As the teams exchanged their experiences, Aiko, observed the dynamics among the genin present. Seems like everyone had their share of challenges. Renjiro couldn't help but feel a sense of pride in their team. We made it this far, and we'll keep pushing forward. Let's see what the next phase has in store for us. After a bit of banter, they headed to their rooms to rest. They were informed about the meditation rooms that had elemental chakra crystals. The crystals were said to help improve someone's chakra nature. Since it was still in the evening, they decided to head there. As the Genins settled into the meditation rooms, the atmosphere exuded a calming ambience that contrasted sharply with the tension of the exams. The room provided a serene space for reflection and mental preparation. Aiko, on the other hand, approached another wind room with a sense of curiosity. It was a new experience for her, and she couldn't help but express her enthusiasm, this is amazing. I've never been in a meditation room before. What do we do? Renjiro, with a small smile, responded, just find a comfortable position, close your eyes, and focus on your breathing. Aiko nodded. She took a deep breath, allowing the tranquility of the room to envelop her. The rhythmic sounds of her breathing synchronized with the ambient stillness, creating a serene symphony. Hiro, familiar with the concept of the rooms from his clan's practices, found an earth room and began to assume a meditative posture. Renjiro, having experienced such settings in the Uchiha compound, joined a wind room without hesitation since the fire ones were crowded. The minutes passed in a tranquil haze until some hours passed. After they left their rooms, Aiko remarked, that was, refreshing. I can see why you guys find this helpful. Renjiro grinned, yeah. It's a nice break from the chaos outside. With renewed clarity, Team 15 left the meditation room and headed to their rooms to rest. The following day arrived, marking the end of the first phase of the Chunin exams. All the 30 Genin teams, along with the additional four teams that joined them, gathered in the central area of the tower. The atmosphere was a mix of relief, anticipation, and the lingering tension of the upcoming phases. Hiro glanced around, sizing up the other teams that had successfully completed the first phase of the exam. Over 30 teams finished the first phase. The fact that we are that many means that they are strong genins taking the exam, he commented, his eyes scanning the group. Us coming last might actually be a good thing, people may see us as pushovers in the next phase. Renjiro thought. Aiko nodded, acknowledging the feet of the other genins. Surviving that forest is no small achievement but it's still good to see more teams make it through. 
Rinjiro chimed in, I wonder what the next phase is going to be. How are these exams usually held? Rinjiro asked because he realized that leaving things to his assumptions might not be the best thing to do. There was already one change that he did not anticipate, so there was bound to be more. Don't you live in the Uchiha clan? How do you not know about this? I only came to the village around four years ago Hiro, knowing this was not one of my priorities when I arrived here. I almost forgot. Hiro lamented and he tried his best not to make the situation more awkward. Um, they usually have two phases, the first one in the forest of death, and the other one in front of the village. They were all fully aware of the circumstances that led to Renjiro coming to Kanoha, but the way Renjiro carried himself made them forget he had such a past. Hiro, Aiko, and a majority of their former academy classmates empathized with Renjiro since a majority of them had either lost a parent or two due to the wars that happened between the major shinobi villages. So after this, we will have to fight in front of the village? Aiko asked, this was also her first exposure to the competition besides watching from the stands. Yes, then most of the winners will be promoted to the Chunin rank, Hiro answered. I probably should have researched on this. Right now nothing is assured because the future could also change because of my involvement. But with that said, I should have a week before participating in the fights. This should be enough for my training arc. Right? As they exchanged thoughts and speculations, other teams also engaged in similar conversations, sharing stories of their experiences for the next phase of the exam. In the midst of these discussions, Taki appeared, garnering the attention of the gathered genins. The man's authoritative presence hushed all the present genins. Listen up, everyone, Taki's voice resonated through the grounds. Congratulations on making it through the forest of death. However, the journey doesn't end here. The next phase awaits, but we need to narrow down our participants. The eyes focused on him, with the genins awaiting further instructions. In three days, the preliminaries for the next phase will be held at Ground 7, Taki announced. Given the number of teams, which is 34, we have about a hundred participants. The preliminaries are mandatory, they serve to sift through the candidates and select the top 32 genins who will advance to the next phase. Now this is more familiar, maybe it might not exactly be as Hiro mentioned. Rinjiro thought as murmurs rippled through the genins. It was clear that they were surprised by the change in the normal schedule of the exams. Some were displeased because the sifting that Taki mentioned only meant one thing. More battles. On the other hand, a particular group, Rinjiro included, was ecstatic because of this development. The competition was about to intensify and they needed to do their best to secure a spot among the top contenders. Taki's stern gaze swept across the assembly, be prepared. The preliminaries will test not only your combat skills but also your strategy, adaptability, and decision-making under pressure. It's your chance to prove that you have what it takes to advance further. With those words, Taki Shimura signaled the end of their current respite and the genin dispersed, all of them heading to their homes. Yes, meditation was great, but Renjiro craved sleep more than anything after the week he had had. What should I do? Three days is actually a lot of time when you think about it, actually make that two and half days since I almost slept for half a day. After racking his head for a while, Renjiro finally got a light bulb moment. I could actually try that, he nodded. His plan for the next few days majorly involved one thing. It was watching. Renjiro planned on visiting the clan training grounds and just watching people who trained there, but more on that later. Similarly, countless genins who were participating in the exams put the final touches to their preparations as time matched onward unforgivingly. Soon, it was the day when the preliminaries would start. Uzumaki Renjiro. Renjiro stepped forward as soon as he had his name being called. He had been waiting for far too long. The Chunins overseeing this phase of the exam had been calling everyone up front in alphabetic order. With both his initials being on the latter end of the scale, it was understandable they would take a long time to get to him. You know the instruction, pick three numbers from the bag and return to your position, said a Chunin. Rinjiro rightfully did so, and after a mild shuffle of the said bag, he got three papers from the bag. You may return, the Chunin handling things ordered. This was the first thing they did after arriving in training ground 7. The genins were informed that they would participate in three battles and their results would determine whether they make it to the next stage. 
To even qualify in the run for the top 32 candidates, they had to at least win two of their three matches. Afterwards, both their performances from the Forest of Death and the preliminaries would be considered in ranking them. This meant that for any of the Genins from Team 15 to even have a shot at becoming Chunins, they had to have a stellar performance during the preliminaries. Their result in the Forest of Death was not that bad, but it was not to the standards Riku had set for his team. Renjiro checked the papers he had got, and the numbers on them were 99, 45 and 27. The papers were clearly labeled, so Renjiro had no problems in knowing the order of the numbers. 99 is first, so that means that I'll be in the first batch of people fighting. The other numbers are 45 and 27, so I'll have a relative break to rest, not that I am planning on breaking any sweat. Since there were 34 teams, that meant that they were 102 genins fighting today. The numbers they fought not only decided when they would fight but also who they would fight. The genin who picked number 1 would fight number 102 and so on. This meant that Renjiro would fight numbers 4, 58 and 76 for the first, second and third rounds respectively. With a total of 153 battles scheduled to happen, they prepared 17 fighting spaces for the genins meaning that each round had 3 batches fighting. Renjiro quickly located his fighting space and was surprised by who he was fighting. Hmm, her again? This year, they really did make the exams challenging, right? Yes, Taki was serious when he said he was going to change how things were done. Senju Riku and Yamanaka Shirmora were in the stands having a conversation as the first batch of fights in the first round were about to begin. Fortunately, both of their teams, Team 15 for Riku and Team 14 for Shirmora, qualified to participate in the second phase of the exam. But don't you think he is being more strict to the kids? I don't see any need for the preliminaries, Shirmora remarked. If being strict will save their lives later, then so be it, Renjiro replied. We all got promoted to the Chunin rank using the same system. We turned out right, didn't we? Shermora countered. You, of all people, should know that that's a lie. Giving these kids the best chances they can get, especially during these hard times, is the best thing we could do. The remark brought on a somber mood. They all internally paid respects to their fallen comrades. Trying to lighten up the mood, Riku continued, besides, the system Taki is implementing is more complete than what we have ever seen. The first phase in the forest tested their teamwork and how they would navigate obstacles. These preliminaries, which serve as the second phase, test their individual combat prowess. Riku took a deep breath before continuing, from what I hear about the next phase, it will test their strategic capabilities, which is paramount for any Chunin. Anyway, Eugenin is about to start his fight. I have been hearing a lot about him, we should probably pay attention, in one of the fighting places prepared, Renjiro was walking to his designated place for the first round. Hmm, her again? Renjiro wondered as he finally saw who was his opponent for the first round. It was Hiro Hyuga. They had fought during their Genin promotion exams where she came in first while Renjiro came in third. Clearly, a rematch was warranted by Renjiro. Small world, right? Renjiro remarked. What are you talking about? Never mind. A Chunin refereeing the match asked them if they were ready and after receiving a nod from both of them, he commanded, begin. The minute the two Genins heard the command, they all activated their dojitsus. Renjiro with his Sherigan and Hiro with her Byakugan. Eight Trigrams Mountain Crusher. Hiro shouted. Since Renjiro was just staring at her, Hiro decided to take the initiative and threw a palm strike aiming towards Renjiro's top left shoulder. It was not a normal palm strike since Hiro was emitting chakra from her palms. So predictable. She is trying to attack my chakra network. Renjiro anticipated the attack, swiftly dodging to the side with a graceful sidestep. Relying on his Sharingan, he kept dodging and redirecting the jabs from Hiro's taijutsu technique. After some time, a realization hit Renjiro. It was stupid trying to engage her in close combat. I might have improved, but so did she. Renjiro tried creating some distance between Hiro and him, but Hiro could not let him do so. This is frustrating. Thought Hiro. She had previously fought Renjiro, but that was more than a year ago, he couldn't have improved that much, right? But to her surprise, Renjiro was fighting her on even terms. 
What was more frustrating was that he was either dodging her strikes or deflecting them. It was hard using her chakra and not seeing any results. I need to finish this quickly. Let's see how he handles this. Hiro changed her stance as she prepared to use another technique. 8 trigram 64 pal dash, just as she was about to initiate her technique, Hiro stopped in her tracks as she stared at Renjiro's eyes. Bad mistake. Or was it? A Jinjutsu? Seriously? Did you think that trick would work on me? Hiro asked as she promptly broke the Jinjutsu that Renjiro tried to ensnare her with. With the help of her Byakugan, she was able to see through the Jinjutsu. She only took around 2 or 3 seconds to escape the Jinjutsu, but that time was all Renjiro needed to flip back a few meters to achieve his goal. No. But this might. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. Renjiro said as he took a deep breath before putting his hand on his mouth and releasing fire from it. The fire coming out of Renjiro's mouth congregated into a huge fireball and headed directly towards Hiro. Renjiro was not mad to try and use Jinjutsu on a Hyuga. Okay, he was mad since he wanted to test his Taijutsu prowess against Hiro, but that was besides the case. He did not bank on the Jinjutsu working, but he knew Hiro would take time to break away from the Jinjutsu even if it was seconds. The time she took would give him enough time to create space for him to double down on his strength. His chakra. Hiro saw the fireball heading towards her, but she wasn't alarmed. 8 trigrams palms revolving heaven. She shouted. Hiro emitted chakra from a majority of her tenketsus. She then spun around, trying to block the attack. Fortunately for her, she was able to block fireball from causing any harm to her. Jutsus like these are no dash, Hiro began before she was rudely interrupted by Renjiro. Yeah, yeah. You talk too much. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. Renjiro released another fireball jutsu towards Hiro. What dash, Hiro was surprised, but she didn't have time to do so as she had to defend herself. Fire style, great fireball jutsu. Wait dash, fire style, great fireball jutsu. Renjiro kept spamming the jutsu, forcing Hiro to grasp on straws while defending. The continuous spamming of the flashy fire jutsu drew attention from the stands and also from some of the genins fighting alongside them. It was hard for them not to pay attention to the fight as it was equally destructive as it had become one-sided. Yes, Hiro had good defensive techniques as a Hyuga, but she had to have the stamina to keep on defending. She even decided to erect earth walls, but Renjiro's jutsu was too much for the walls. The fight quickly changed to Hiro's stamina versus Renjiro's chakra reserves. It did not take long for Hiro to give in to Renjiro's relentless assault. I concede, Hiro said before collapsing. Uzumaki Renjiro wins. The referee declared as medics went ahead to attend to Hiro. Renjiro exited the fighting space, much to the awe of a lot of viewers, as his fight had drawn the attention of Jenins, Chunins, and even Jounins who were present in training ground 7. Riku, who was with Shimura in the stands, couldn't help but smirk at Renjiro's performance. He had been disappointed at first when he began the fight in close combat with Hiro but was happy Renjiro decided to switch things up. Thank God that she had terrible stamina. Renjiro thought as he waited for his next battle. If Renjiro was honest, he would probably put the Uchihas and Hyuga in the same spot when it came to powerful clans. As long as one was competent enough with either the Dojitsus, then they would eventually become strong. Renjiro waited for a while before his next battle since he had finished his battle quickly. He did not really need the break since he carefully managed his chakra usage, but it was welcomed nonetheless. He faced a civilian genin in the second round which ended far quicker than the first one. For his third round, he met a familiar face as his opponent was Uchiha Amari, the girl his team had a brief encounter back at the Forest of Death. Amari thought that this was a stroke of luck since she had a bone to pick with Renjiro. However, by the end of the fight, she was ruining her so-called luck that had now turned bad. With that, the preliminaries phase of the exams was done. Only a selected few were able to win all of their battles, with Renjiro being the only one from Team 15 to do it. Hiro and Aiko called him a show-off for that but what could he say? He wasn't really trying but he still won, crazy, right? Fortunately, it did not take long before the ranking of the Genins was released. Last but not least, we have Marino Ibiki. All these 32 Genins will move to the final stage of the Chunin exams. 
Congratulations to those who have passed. You will be fighting in front of the village in one week so prepare well. Taki said as he left the platform. As he did, murmurs spread as the genins had different reactions to the results. Most of the reactions were that of disappointment as only around 30% of the genins participating moved to the next phase. Fortunately, all three genins of Team 15 were in this group. Renjiro ranked the highest at the 15th rank, just one spot shy of the bottom half. Hiro and Aiko ranked 20th and 24th respectively. It was clear a majority of the results were determined by the results from the first phase since besides working in teams, it was also about survival. Team 15 did survive, but they were still one of the last teams to arrive at the tower. 15 isn't really a bad number. At least it's above average, so that's a plus. Rinjiro thought as he approached Hiro. 20th? Hiro, you sure are lucky. But I'm not sure someone who wants to be a clan head should be scoring that. Hiro's brows furrowed. He was aware of what Renjiro was trying to do. I still qualified despite coming in close to last at the first phase, Hiro smirked as he continued, besides, if I had better teammates, then we would have cleared the forest earlier. Hiro was as sharp as he was talented. With someone like Renjiro in his team, it was hard to notice. He was a capable shinobi for his age, but Renjiro's sharp tongue was a challenge he never overcame. All I'm hearing is excuses. You were alone during your fights, but you still lost one of them. You don't know who I faced in my last fight. He is a monster and is the dash, Renjiro, just let Hiro be. We all had a mountain to climb, but we still qualified. What matters is how we will perform in the next phase and become Chunins. Aiko interrupted with an attempt to make peace between the two. Alright, Renjiro conceded. Have you guys seen Rika-sensei? Both genins shook their head and just as they were proceeding to look for their sensei, the man in question appeared in front of them. Congratulations, you guys have performed better during this phase than you did during the first. When Team 15 told their sensei about the events that transpired in the Forest of Death, he simply laughed at them. He told them if that was the reason they didn't become Chunins, then they would have to make it up to him through more training. It was not a threat, but it also wasn't the major reason why the three genins worked hard during the three-day break to at least win a majority of their fights. Thank you, Sensei. It was because of you that we could qualify for the last stage, Aiko said. Yeah, we have faced worse in training that made this easier, Hiro added. Sensei, do you know what the final stage will entail? We only know that we will be fighting in front of the village. Renjiro inquired. With the changes already made, many had speculated that there would be similar changes to the final stage. Having an inkling of what will happen would really help. Of course, I know what will happen. And? Renjiro finally asked seeing Riku not adding anything besides affirming their speculations. You just have to wait and see. Telling you about it now would mean that I don't have faith in you guys passing. In what way are those two things related? Renjiro thought in frustration. It was a sentiment shared by all of them. Before I forget, Riku said as a serious atmosphere fell on him, if you guys need any guidance during this coming week, I will be free so you guys can come to my house. It might be the last time I get to guide you guys as Genins, so feel free to come. The Genins all agreed to do so and left for their homes. They had one week before the conclusion of the exam, and they had to make good use of it. I should definitely focus on my ninjutsu for this one week as it would be more impactful in the short term, Renjiro muttered as he took a detour to the clan library. What chakra nature should I focus on? I need defensive jutsu, so earth should be one of them. I also need to have some variety in my offensive capabilities. Stoking up on wind and fire jutsus should help. After making up his mind, Renjiro headed to the wind and earth sections and selected a couple of jutsus. He didn't need to go to the fire section because he had spent a day at the clan training grounds memorizing people's jutsu. He had the Sharingan, so Renjiro thought that the best way to know how suitable a jutsu was by seeing someone else perform it. Through this exercise, he had memorized a lot of fire-style jutsus, what was left was getting down to learn them. These eight should be enough to keep me busy for a whole week. The jutsus that Renjiro picked were, Violent Wind, Blade of Wind and Wind Wave. Headhunter and Earthwall were the two jutsus he chose of Earth nature. He couldn't choose more with the risk of not mastering them by the end of the week. Out of the memorized jutsus, Renjiro decided to learn Fire Wave, 
Flame Whirlwind and Phoenix Sage Flower Nail Crimson. The last one being a personal favorite. The Flame and Wind Wave Jutsus were chosen solely for the fact that Renjiro could use them at the same time. The Flame Wave would give the Wind Wave more destructive capabilities, while the latter would amplify the former. The synergy was just too good. Flame Whirlwind was more of a control skill that would help when facing more than one opponent. It was a clear upgrade of both the Fireball and its greater variant. The last Fire Jutsu was one he wanted to learn besides the Raisingan. Phoenix Sage Flower Nail Crimson was one of Itachi's signature Jutsus. The Jutsu allowed the user to exhale fire to moving shurikens to increase their destructive potential by making them capable of inflicting severe burns upon direct contact with either the intended victim or any other object caught within their trajectories. Due to the chakra-based nature of the flames that surround them, the shuriken will continue to burn after impact, regardless of the flammability of the object that they ultimately collide with. This was one of the most versatile jutsu in Renjiro's arsenal now. The headhunter jutsu could allow him to move underground which would help with evasion. It was similar to what the Hozuki brother did to escape the collapse of their base during one of Team 15's missions. The violent wind was a tricky but effective jutsu, that allowed the user to form wind around them by releasing wind nature chakra to the environment. The earth wall was pretty much self-explanatory as it was a good defensive jutsu. It was not that Renjiro did not trust his evasion speed but their missions were of different natures. You never knew when you would be tasked with protecting a high-risk target. Having such a jutsu would come in handy. The fact that the density of the wall depended on the chakra used was just a cherry on top. I should probably learn the wind one first. Renjiro unfurled the scrolls containing information on the wind wave and started performing the required hand signs. He followed the instructions to the ladder, but the result concerned him. Something is definitely wrong. Something is definitely wrong. Renjiro thought this was the first time he was learning a jutsu after a long time. Renjiro didn't know why, but he felt something was wrong. Is something wrong with my body? No. That shouldn't be the case since I am sure I did not sustain injuries during the Chunin exams. Or is it this jutsu? Renjiro decided to go through his ninjutsu repertoire. He started with his fire jutsus before heading to his wind ones. In total, they were not more than 20, which was something Renjiro was ashamed of if he was honest. Once he started going through his wind nature jutsus he realized the issue. Why do they feel, what's the word for it? Weak. Yeah, why do they feel weak? Renjiro leaned on a closer wall, trying to retrace his steps to troubleshoot the problem he was experiencing. They felt fine when I was in the forest of death, so the change must have happened between that time and now. The only thing that I have done in between is meditate in those rooms at the tower. Wait, that could be it. Ever since Renjiro learned fire and wind jutsus, both natures have always been of similar strength, the only difference being their destruction capabilities. It was similar to one being ambidextrous since he had the dual chakra affinity natures. But now it seemed like he had reverted to only having one of his arms as the stronger one. The fire nature jutsus were now stronger than their wind counterparts. It seemed that I severely underestimated the power of the chakra crystals. If this is the result of a handful of meditation sessions there, then I can't imagine what will be the result of more similar ones. Yes, Renjiro had meditated using the chakra crystals of the clan before, but it was only one session. After seeing little to no improvements to his ninjutsu, he decided to start meditating at his home. It was not that he was lazy, but Renjiro valued the privacy his home offered. Something that he now rued as he realized he would have made a lot of improvement in his ninjutsu. There is no need in crying over spilt milk. I have already recognized the problem, so I just need to rectify it. It's already evening, so this should be the perfect time for meditating. Renjiro quickly made his way to the center of the clan compound. The meditation rooms were situated close to the hall that the Uchiha clan used for their important meetings. At the entrance, he met an overseer and after finishing up with the registration, Renjiro was escorted to the meditation. One important detail that Renjiro realized was that every ninja was given a particular quota that they could use for free. The quotas were different as one ascended the shinobi rank. Academy students had around 30 hours per month while Jenins and Chunins had 80 and 60 hours respectively. 
For jhanans and above, they were not limited to the amount of time they could meditate as the chakra crystals were only efficient to a certain point. That was also the same reason why chunins had less time as compared to jhanans. There are only 8 rooms available out of 16. I should probably go to the wind rooms, but it is not like I had an option since all the fire rooms are occupied. Upon entering the room, Renjiro saw that it closely resembled the ones back at the tower. Probably there was some standardization in their construction. Renjiro sat in the usual lotus position and began his meditation. It was very refreshing as he quickly filled his chakra reserves as he had used some chakra earlier in the day. My reserves are completely full, so where is the chakra I am absorbing going? Since he could not come up with an answer, Renjiro decided to completely focus on the meditation. He only had one week left as a genin, or at least he hoped, so he would use the whole 80 hours to the fullest. True to his word, Renjiro managed to meditate until early the following day. He had not slept but he felt fresh nonetheless. I guess I have to substitute my physical workout time for meditation, or at the very least reduce it because this feels good. After he left the room, Renjiro asked around how the whole concept worked. The overseer gave him a look that seemed to how he became a genin without knowing. Renjiro was already used to such looks whenever he was in the compound due to his physical appearance, so it did not bother him. The explanation is pretty straightforward. When I meditate, I absorb the ambient chakra nature in the room. The chakra, for example, in fire rooms would be of fire nature variety. The chakra would not be used to help me recover my chakra but instead, go directly to my body. Once my body absorbs it, it gets easier for it to quickly convert my chakra to said chakra nature. My chakra is inherently made up of the two natures, so if I continue to use the chakra crystals, I would be able to empower my jutsus without the need to increase the chakra consumption. The chakra crystal would help him in learning various elemental affinities, but it reacts the most with the inherent ones. If the affinity was 44% then it would just increase it. This made sense as everyone's chakra was a composition of all the elemental natures. That was also the main reason why one could use jutsus of elements that weren't their main ones. Anyway, I should start with the wind jutsus first to see whether the changes were perceptible. Renjiro performed the wind wave again and since he had already begun learning it the previous day, he got it in a few tries. The changes are not that conspicuous, but that makes sense because I have only had one meditation session. I am sure that it will start to show by the course of the week just like the fire one did. Renjiro continued the schedule for the majority of the week with him spending most of his days working on the various jutsus he was to learn and finishing the day off with meditation. He kept on alternating the sessions between fire and wind chakra crystals. On the second day, he was able to master the three wind jutsus while on the third day, flame whirlwind and flame wave jutsus were mastered. It was easier because they built up concepts similar to learning the fireball jutsu. On the other hand, he spent another whole day mastering the Phoenix Sage Flower Nail Crimson Jutsu, as it required a bit of multitasking. Renjiro had to ensure that he had infused enough fire into the shurikens while also hitting their mark. Renjiro spent the fifth and sixth days working on the combination jutsus. His target was combining Flame Wave with Wind Wave. The only wave to combine them was using a Shadow Clone while performing either jutsus. Boom! The result might be close to explosion release. Although using might might be an overstatement. Still, I need to get the timing well. If either fire or wind is released first, it offsets the impact by a lot. All in all, this is a good combination jutsu to have. Fire manipulation has always been fun to do. Wait, can I make my flames blue? Blue fire is just fire blasted with more oxygen, right? But how do I approach this? After brainstorming for a while, Renjiro had an idea to work with. Performing a hand sign, he released the flame whirlwind jutsu. After exhaling the spiraling flames, Renjiro quickly performed the violent wind jutsu in succession. His aim was to amplify the fire to its limit. As the two jutsus combined, Renjiro achieved one of his objectives. He could feel the temperature of the overall jutsu rising. It was so obvious that he could feel it without even sensing it. The rise was one gradual ascension that continued until it eventually stopped. Okay, the flames got hotter, so at least we are heading somewhere. 
However, this increased heat is negligible and isn't worth the chakra used when I overcharged the violent wind. Maybe we can try it the other way round. Judging by how basic ninjutsu, especially for this particular one, Renjiro wanted to capture the air around him and forcefully combine it with his fire style. He first released his wind-natured chakra into the environment and initiated the jutsu. Winds around him started to rage as expected. In a similar fashion, he released the flame whirlwind jutsu. The result was, the fire actually went off as it was overpowered by the violent winds. Yes, chakra chakra infused flame released by Renjiro went off. Well, that was a dud. In the first test, fire was stronger and wind was stronger in the second one. It seems I need to find the balance between the two natures since one can't fully support the other as I have been doing. I only have one idea left, so we either make it and achieve blue flames or, just fail and leave this for later. Renjiro initiated the flame wave jutsu. He furrowed his brows as he concentrated on the flame. Bit by bit, the size of the fire that he was releasing began to dim out. Eventually, it suffered the same fate as Trial 2. I can't do this anymore, Renjiro breathed out as he bent and heaved for air. What he tried to do was condense the fire nature chakra that he released. At first, he tried to do so before the chakra left his body, or mouth, but he soon realized that he did not have much control over it. So Renjiro settled for the next best thing, trying to condense the chakra already released. But that was also a mountain he had to overcome as some of the chakra released were dissipating to the environment. It basically forced him to condense as well as try to stop the chakra from dissipating into the environment. The whole process was strenuous as it was akin to holding your breath while running at your top speed. I knew that the expectations were low, but it's still disappointing. I think after all these failures, it is best to consult someone about this. But who though? Miwa or Kushina? Kushina should be better, she seems more open to ideas such as this. Renjiro flickered along the way to Kushina. He had gotten better at the jutsu so it was relatively convenient to use it. Renjiro. How are you? I hope you are preparing for the finals. I will be there watching. Yes, I am. I actually came here to ask you a question. Is it fine with you? Noticing the urgency in Renjiro's body language and voice, Kushina replied, Of course, I already told you that you can ask me anything related to Fuinjutsu so don't worry and just ask. It is related to ninjutsu since I was brushing up on my ninjutsu. Ninjutsu? He might be promising in Fuinjutsu, but he is still a genin. This should be easy. Kushina thought as she gestured for Renjiro to continue. Minutes later, Kushina was not sharing her earlier sentiments after Renjiro explained his current situation. What is this? Blue flames? Fire is fire. As long as it serves its intended aim, then everything is fine. You brat. You already know about Matatabi and that other brat Maki. A voice from within Kushina boomed. Kushina did not even react to it and ignored it. Still, what this bastard is saying has some truth to it. Maki's fire is the strongest we have ever faced, granted it is Matatabi's chakra, but it is still strong. That's a really good interesting idea Renjiro, but you are still too inexperienced to try that. Why? If something like that was achievable, then even Lord Third would already have such a jutsu. I am not saying that it is impossible, but such a feat would require such precise chakra control that you currently don't have. Kushina pursued to ensure that Renjiro was keenly listening to her. You are still a young shinobi, so you should wait till your body fully grows, since you will also need larger chakra reserves. Your chakra control is something that will inevitably improve as you continue using jutsus, so just be patient. Besides, ascending few in jutsu ranks will also shorten the process. Why is she talking as if our age gap is that much? If I could guess, it would be between 5 and 7 years. Still, what she is saying makes sense. I already have a final to prepare for, so let's shelve this for a while. Alright, I will do so. Thank you, Kushina. I will have to take my leave since I have the Chunin exams finals the day after tomorrow. It's okay, Renjiro. I will come to see your performance. Although I won't be able to show my support, just know I will be watching. I will. Since Renjiro decided to shelf the blue flame idea, he focused on his combination jutsu as well as his earth nature jutsus. Fortunately, he wrapped up his short training arc just as the faded day arrived. 
It seems, the celebrations this time would be unique Haruzan, said a deep baritone voice. From the regalia he had on and the charisma he exuded, it was clear this was Oishi Hideki, the current daimyo of the Land of Fire. Of course, we need to increase the morale of the village during these tough times. Our shinobi will be a testimony that the village can still protect them. And what do you think, Danzo? Oishi inquired. This will serve as a show of force to the spies hidden within the village that Konoha's next generation will be as powerful as the previous one. I guess we will just have to find out, Oishi said as his gaze trailed on the 32 genins standing on the stage. Listen carefully, as you have probably noticed, you are all standing according to your ranks, as Taki paused, all the genins scanned their counterparts. The aim of this final is really simple. All you will be challengers. You will all be given three chances to challenge someone of higher rank, however, the person you intend to challenge must not be more than five ranks than your current rank. Once you challenge someone, you will head down to the grounds and fight against them, the match will only end when one loses their conscience or concedes. There will be no limit to the number of times one can be challenged. But remember, if you challenge someone and lose the match, you will instead drop ranks. Taki smiled as he relished the anguish on the faces of the young genins before him. If one took a closer look, a certain redhead among the genins actually smiled, thinking of the challenge they were going to face. This is going to be interesting. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.